Good afternoon and welcome to the Observatorio Annual Symposium, which we are happy to celebrate in this research center of the Instituto Cervantes at Harvard University every year. For this year's symposium, which is our seventh, we chose the general subject, culture and thought of the Hispanic world in the US. And we have an exciting program with papers on different topics relating to this, this broad uh, subject by researchers who are either starting their professional careers or are already experts in these, uh, in these uh, fields of study. We, have, we, we actually have two widely acclaimed uh, professors who will deliver the opening and the closing keynote lecture. And I am very pleased and honored to introduce today our first keynote speaker, Professor Barbara Fuchs, who will open the symposium with a fascinating topic, American classics, diversity and Hispanic cultures in the US. And I'm very pleased to introduce her to you just briefly, uh, uh, because what, what I suppose you're really interested in is, is to, in listening to her. Professor Fuchs, uh, has a, a BA and an EMA degree in comparative literature by Yale University and a PhD in comparative literature too by uh, Stanford University. Um, uh, today she is at UCLA where she is distinguished professor and vice chair of graduate studies in the department of Spanish and Portuguese and she has a joint appointment as Distinguished Professor of English in the Department uh, of English at UCLA, at the university in which he, she has also uh, directed the Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies, as well as the Clark Memorial Library. Before UCLA, Professor Barbara Fuchs taught at the University of, Wisconsin, sorry, of Washington and at the University of Pennsylvania. Trained as a comparatist in English, Spanish, uh, French, and Italian, Professor Fuchs works on European cultural production from the late 15th through the 17th centuries with a special emphasis on literature and empire and on theater and performance in transnational contexts. Other research interests uh, uh, of Professor Fuchs are early modern Spanish and English literature Mediterranean and transatlantic studies, transnationalism and literary history, race and religion in the early modern uh, world, multilingualism and translation and performance. And she in fact directs the, uh, the UCLA working group on the com Comedia or Comedia in translation and performance. And it's diversifying the classics initiative, which is an initiative which aims to foster awareness and appreciation of Hispanic classical theater, mainly Spanish golden age um, theater. Professor Fuchs, as you can imagine, has numerous publications. I, let me just mention uh, three or four books, for example, Mimesis and Empire, The New World, Islam and the Construction of European Identities from 2001, Passing for Spain, Cervantes and the Fictions of Identity from, from 2003, or Exotic Nation, Morophilia and the Construction of Early Modern Spain from 2009. And more recently, I've just mentioned two, Knowing Fictions, Picaresque Reading in the Early Modern Hispanic World from 2021. And uh, uh, also from the same year, Theater of Lockdown, Digital and Distanced Performance in a Time of Pandemic, which is one of the first studies on how theater was transformed for, uh, uh, by COVID-19, which was published, published as I just said, I just, I just said in 2021 by Matthew N. Professor Fuchs is, also, is a past editor of the prestigious Hispanic Review, and she also edits the series, The Comedia in Translation and Performance for the publishing house of Juan de la Cuesta. And she's also the director of La Escena, Los Angeles Biennial Festival of Hispanic Classical Theater, which she herself founded in, in 2018. In 2021, Professor Fuchs served as president of the, of the Modern Language Association, and she made, she chose the uh, topic of multilingualism 
uh, as her presidential theme for the 2022 MLA annual convention in, in Washington, DC. And in 2021 too, Professor Fuchs received the inaugural Premio Eñe from the Instituto Cervantes for her role, her important role in the promotion of Spanish language and culture. She was presented with this uh, award by His Majesty El Rey Felipe VI de España on the occasion of the Instituto Cervantes 30th anniversary in 2021. This honorary distinction was created to recognize individuals or legal entities who have promoted the Spanish language around the world. And Professor uh, Barbara Fox has dedicated her career to the promotion of Spanish language and literary history internationally. So, it, it, uh, so it's not a surprise that she was the very first person or legal entity to receive this prestigious award by the Instituto Cervantes. So we are very pleased, very honored to have you here, Professor Fox. Thank you so much for accepting your invita our, our invitation and you have the floor now. Thank you so much, Martha. It's really um, a pleasure to be here and uh, to contribute in some small way to the work you're doing. Um, as you, I'm sure you know, we're eagerly awaiting the Instituto Cervantes here in LA. And in the interim, it's really very nice to be able to um, participate in this mode. So um, I'm going to address today um, the question of how we think about the classics in the US and uh, more broadly, how language politics overlays constructions of culture. So I'll begin by examining how key thinkers have interrogated the role of language and culture in various Americas. And I will then turn more specifically to the Diversifying the Classics project that I direct at UCLA and its work to expand the category of the classics so as to include the Hispanic tradition. Um, so this is my title. American Classics, Diversity and Hispanic Cultures in the US. And the first section of this talk is entitled On American Belonging. What kind of polity does the Spanish language enable or animate? What is the place of Spanish in the Americas or America? I start with three books of essentially the same title, each gesturing towards the others as predecessors and whose own arguments and translation histories Tell us much about what language can and cannot suture, what communities it enables, and how multilingualism might be imagined in the national space. These three works are entitled in two different languages, Nuestra América, Our America. In various ways, they all explore the relationship between language and politics, the macro and the micro, the local and the national. Though they share a title, they represent very different genres and conceptions of belonging at various times in the history of the Americas. Across their own multiple publication histories and implicit dialogue with each other, they all grapple with language as a marker of solidarity or inclusion. So the first and by far the most famous of the three is Jose Marti's essay, Nuestra América, first published in 1891 in both El Partido Liberal in Mexico City and in La Revista Ilustrada de Nueva York. The second is Felipe Fernández Armesto's popularizing history, Our America, which adds the subtitle, A Hispanic History of the United States, published in New York by Norton in 2014 and almost immediately translated into Spanish. The third is Claudio Lomni's family memoir, Nuestra América, Utopía y Persistencia de una Familia Judía, published in 2018 by the Fondo de Cultura Económica in Mexico City, and subsequently adapted and expanded by the author as Nuestra América, My Family in the Vertigo of Translation, published by Other Press in New York in 2021. Martí's strongly anti-imperialist manifesto is hopeful, perhaps even utopian, on the power of language and culture to produce political alignments. The Nuestra América that Martí conjures as a bulwark against US, US imperialism after decades of war among the new nations of the Americas is a much desired mirage. The author is frank about the challenges of transcending centuries of imperial domination to reconcile very different populations behind a united political project. 
Yet Martí sidelines Sarmiento's earlier dichotomy of civilización y barbarie as the racializing internal choice facing the new nations and warns instead against an encroaching US imperialism. The choice Martí stresses is therefore between la falsa erudición y la naturaleza, rendering the natural and the local the source of knowledge. Although Martí urges the convergence of Latin American nations, he is rueful about opportunities missed and phrases them in the past conditional. El genio, he says, hubiera estado en hermanar con la caridad del corazón y con el atrevimiento de los fundadores, la vincha y la toga, en desestancar al indio, en ir haciendo lado al negro suficiente, en ajustar la libertad al cuerpo de los que se alzaron y vencieron por ella. Martí's own racial prejudices, which critics have noted in recent years, complicate the project of Latin American unity. Yet a kind of imagined community based on experience shared in a shared language remains a powerful beacon for him. Se ponen en pie los pueblos y se saludan. ¿Cómo somos? Se preguntan. Y unos a otros se van diciendo cómo son. Martí elaborates imagining both new and more inclusive American forms of knowledge. Se saludan de un pueblo a otro los hombres nuevos americanos. Surgen los estadistas naturales del estudio directo de la naturaleza. Los dramaturgos traen los caracteres nativos a la escena. Las academias discuten temas viables. La poesía se corta la melena zorrillesca y cuelga del, de la, del árbol glorioso el chaleco colorado. La prosa, centellante y cernida, va cargada de ideas. Los gobernadores en las repúblicas de indios aprenden indio. There is much shedding of the apparatus of European culture, much learning from nature before Martí makes room for indigenous languages and presumably the knowledge that they bring. Yet, however incipiently, Martí acknowledges how the Americas require new forms of culture marked by place, even as they share a common language across vast geographies. West America has had a complicated reception history to say the least. As critic and translator Esther Allen has noted, the delay in translating Martí into English significantly limited his impact in the US. Initially, Allen explains, Martí's work lacked the context or the cultural capital to make it legible. Unlike, say, de Tocqueville or Dickens, he did not have a European's a priori claim on a US reading public. By the time Latin America became more legible to the US, the Cuban Revolution and the Cold War had made Martí suspect as a communist sympathizer avant la lettre. Remarkably, a selection of his prose did not appear in English until 100 years after his birth, with the publication of Juan Dionisio's translation, The America of José Martí, in 1953. More recently, however, the fortunes of Nuestra América have changed. The essay has paradoxically helped reshape the field of American studies as both evidence of Latinx subjects shaping American modernities, as in the work of uh, Laura Lomas, and perhaps paradoxically, as an example of a hemispheric perspective, despite Martí's strong distinction between two Americas at odds with each other. Our America is now part of the Norton Anthology of American Literature, along with translated versions of Columbus, Las Casas, Cortés, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. What would Martí have made of this gesture? Generously intended, no doubt, but subsuming these Spanish and Criollo authors into national and linguistic uniformity. Fernández Armesto's Our America offers a powerful rationale for their inclusion, arguing for the Hispanic presence in what would become the US long before that nation came into being. This historian's book argues against the quote, Anglo unease with Spanish speakers as recent immigrants by emphasizing all the ways in which quote, Hispanics preceded the United States in what is now national territory. In a sense, Fernández Armesto parries Martí to claim a place in what lies beyond his predecessors imagined boundaries. In Fernández Armesto's title, America is the US, but the cultural and linguistic distinctions between it and Martí's América break down at every stage. Language and culture, he argues, are more significant than national borders and should instead encourage us to rethink national histories 
predicated upon arbitrary exclusion. Fernández Armesto offers a history from the South rather than from the East, emphasizing those other strands beyond the standard Anglo narrative. And I cite, today's plural America looks in these perspectives like a product of the whole of America's past, not a threat to traditional US identity. There was, we learn, no single frontier, no single language or tradition or identity, no manifest destiny, no culture that deserves to be hegemonic or that predominates or ought to predominate by virtue of US historical experience. Fernandez Almesto tells the story of the earliest European settlements on the continent from Florida to California, Hispanics become the population displaced or dislodged rather than the latest arrivals. The first Europeans to settle in what is now US territory, he archly notes, were the Spaniards in Puerto Rico in 1505, over a hundred years before Jamestown, even though that later settlement vies with Plymouth as privileged origin in the Anglo imagination. Contesting the origin stories and trajectories that inevitably privilege an Anglo version of the US, Fernandez Armesto reimagines our America to include Hispanics at every stage. Though he underscores the violence against native peoples from the English as from the Spanish, he is more interested in the inter-imperial rivalries between England and Spain than in interrogating the givens of a settler nation, the more challenging project that Martí, however partially or awkwardly, addresses in Nuestra América. Nonetheless, Fernández Armesto's history effectively demonstrates how contingent and partial is any notion of the United States that does not include Hispanics and the Spanish language. And I should note here that the more recent uh, book, An American Language, The History of Spanish in the United States by Rosina Lozano, also a historian, makes the even stronger argument that in the Southwest, quote, Spanish was a language of governance required to build a US political system in the region. The recognition of multilingualism historically and in the now, these historians argue, is key for changing our conception of the US. Most recently, anthropologist uh, Claudio Lomnitz returns us to a complex vision of multilingualism and migration with his Nuestra America. Um, Lomnitz initially set out to write a family memoir recounting how his grandparents fled anti-Semitic persecution and violence in Eastern Europe for Peru, Colombia, and Chile. Yet between the original Spanish text and the English translation, which he produced himself, his project gradually grew into a reflection on how, Lomnitz explains, the traditional formulation about Latin American culture is missing something key, which is the connection between the 20th century destruction of Europe and what we understand today as Latin America. As Lomnitz notes, when he first commissioned a translation, he first commissioned a translation of his book, but then realized it would need to be completely rewritten in light of new archival evidence, but also to balance what was and was not familiar for a Latin American versus a US audience. Though Lomnitz moves between Americas, there remains a need for cultural translation beyond language itself. The expanded English version begins with a paradox that defamiliarizes notions of belonging. And I quote, this is an account, oh, sorry. This is an account that speaks of how have I gone out of the chat? Uh, forgive me. Mm, I'm sorry, we were doing so well. There we go. I think I'm in the slide still, yeah, yes? Fine, yep, mm -hmm. not worry. There we go, sorry. Um, this, this, so the, this is an account that speaks of how strangers um, help shape everything that we call ours, Lomnitz tells us. As shadows, scapegoats, witnesses, and as those willing to do what the normative subject won't do, strangers play a role far greater than their quote, cameo appearances would suggest. Lomnitz thus connects the migrations of his own diasporic family to migrants today, and explores how those who may be absolutely necessary to their societies are nonetheless quote, always made to feel dispensable. As Lomnitz's parents, Sina and Larissa leave Europe for Chile and Colombia respectively, they bring with them a complex set of relations to language from the father's quote, chameleon strategy 
as he successfully blends in to the mother's refusal to teach Russian or Yiddish to her children in light of the trauma that she associates with those languages. Arguably, the central figures in the volume are the author's maternal grandparents, Misha Adler and Remy Milstein, who fled Romania for Peru. In the Lima of the mid 1920s, the two became part of the circle of the notable Peruvian intellectual, Jose Carlos Mariategui. As he excavates this to some surprising intellectual connection, Lomnitz foregrounds the universalism of Peru's most famous advocate for indigenous rights. Mariategui, he notes, argued for the Peruvianization of Peru with the motto, all that is human is ours, and reiterated in the first issue of his famous journal, Amauta, everything human belongs to us. This vision of Mariategui's indigenismo as a porous cosmopolitan movement was bracing for its time, acknowledging Peru's past and present indigeneity while squarely facing the future. Lomnitz is keenly interested in how a minoritarian presence, the Jewish exiles of whom his own family were notable examples, participated in the intellectual fervor of these years. His grandparents, he argued, contributed to the universalism of Mariategui's circle while also reconceiving their own identity via their encounter with indigeneity in a place where Jews were, quote, ambiguously identified as European. So his own family ended up in Berkeley in yet another trajectory of Hispanics into the US, in this case as a migration built upon another migration. Lomnitz's implicit dialogue with Marti's essay thus, thus suggests how Nuestra America might apply also to relative newcomers in the North as in the South. It also underscores the role that unacknowledged and minoritarian migrants play in the construction of the nation, even when those contributions are not acknowledged. Personal stories of displacement in a multitude of imperfectly preserved tongues are the warp to the weft of national languages. Together, these three versions of Nuestra America envision powerful alliances built on language and culture, whether in a Latin America jointly positioned against the US or within the US itself, or in a cosmopolitan Peru that welcomes and absorbs Euro European Jews. Fernandez Armesto and Lomnitz dialogue with Martí's modern classic to suggest a vibrant ongoing debate about the place of Spanish in these Americas. So I turn now to a far more, far more personal experience of addressing Spanish classics in America, as in the Americas, and of the work that culture can do to promote inclusion. This involves a pivot in this talk, as in my own career as a scholar, to a much more activist, public-facing, and engaged version of the humanities, one which I have found hugely invigorating and which I hope you will find exciting to hear about. So two, diversifying the classics. Through the Diversifying the Classics project, which I founded at UCLA in 2014, we try to make room for a more diverse sense of the classics, foregrounding the Hispanic tradition as it reached across the Atlantic. Our website asks, what lies beyond Shakespeare in a deliberate provocation designed to help audiences realize the extent to which we've granted Shakespeare an uncontested and unexamined pride of place as the classical corpus to which theater makers and audiences turn without considering how our notion of the classics includes some traditions and excludes others. For eight years, we have been striving to disseminate the corpus of Hispanic comedia, translating texts never before translated into English, commissioning adaptations, presenting them at the La Escena Festival, which we founded in 2018 as the first Hispanic classical theater festival on the West Coast. And that we that I keep referring to, I should say, is an amazing evolving group of graduate students and faculty with the occasional addition of a theater professional or two. We also develop educational materials, record audiobooks, write books for children and more. We have long collaborated with artists and institutions throughout the United States, Mexico, Canada, and of course, Spain. Our work is inspired by the idea that to achieve diversity in the space of the classics, we should ensure not only the th that not only the theater makers, but also the texts themselves should be diverse in order to reconstruct a richer and more varied past and to underline that Hispanic culture in the Americas as in Europe has a history of centuries. We foreground works written on both sides of the Atlantic 
and performed by companies based in North America, Spain, and Latin America to give life with our small contribution to the long tradition that unites us. Our project makes a very modest point that there are classics and classical traditions beyond Shakespeare, particularly for Los Angeles, but more broadly for the nation that the US is today, and especially for the nation that it is becoming, attending to Spanish and to the tradition of Hispanic classics is key. In fact, undoing the racialization and cultural marginalization of Spanish in the US requires no less. Diversifying the classics therefore promotes Hispanic classical theater, which has largely gone unproduced and unremarked in US theatrical circles. The project's goal is to introduce that corpus in the original, in translation or in adaptations into the Los Angeles theater scene and beyond, while promoting a larger conversation about the role of the classical canon and its diversification in a multilingual, multi-ethnic and multicultural contemporary US. Much like the Nuestra America, Our America triad that I discussed earlier, our project highlights both the importance of Hispanic culture within the US and the ways in which it has been sidelined despite its centrality. Importantly, the project is not exclusively in Spanish. In fact, translation into English is at its very heart. It instead makes the case for the inclusion and visibility of Hispanic cultures in a diverse US. Connecting the early modern Hispanic canon to Latinos in the US today is hardly straightforward. Yet although the politics of Latinidad are complex and one cannot by any means draw a straight line of heritage between golden age playwrights and say Los Angeles school kids in the 21st century, it is important nonetheless to recover the rich traditions that link Spain, Latin America and an increasingly Latino US particularly when one considers that the early modern context from which the plays emerge is absolutely transatlantic with playwrights and their texts crossing back and forth across the ocean. And here one might think of the strategic value of figures such as Alarcón or Sor Juana, Mexicans before there was Mexico, who helped bridge that transatlantic and colonial gap. Moreover, while identification for Latinx audiences is certainly desirable, it is not the only goal. Instead, we'd like to signal to the culture at large that Hispanic culture deserves a place at the table and the powerful status of the classic. Thus, while we certainly want to reach Latinos, we are interested primarily in reaching out to practitioners and educators of all ethnicities to alert them to the possibilities that this canon offers without ghettoizing it. Hence, the initiative does not involve just performances in Spanish, but also a combination of translations and adaptations with as much of the original as might be feasible in different contexts and as the pro project progresses. At the very heart of the project is our translation workshop, which meets every other week year round to produce collaborative translations of plays that for the most part have never before been translated into English. From a corpus of about 10,000 excellent plays, we try to choose ones that will appeal to contemporary audiences and theater makers and have particularly centered our efforts on plays that highlight female agency, the, the constructedness of identity, and other aspects that audiences find surprisingly modern in these texts. As we often say, the past is not conservative just because it is past. One aspect in particular that often surprises audiences used to Shakespeare is the centrality and agency of women, both in the production of the works as writers, company managers and actresses and within the text themselves. So allow me to underscore this point. The explicit goal of our project is to produce translations for performance. To that end, we emphasize a flexible and accessible register and the privileging of any visual or physical cues that might be critical for performers. When we need to translate an untranslatable pun, for example, or to render something that makes no sense in translation, we make a point of preserving imagery that an actor might be able to work with, such as any clues to physical humor, sexual innuendo, of course, is a big one here. Whenever possible, we attempt to have actors contribute to or respond to the translation while it is in process in what is a collaborative and collegial process. We decided early on that we would translate every line, every mythological reference, leaving it up to directors to cut where necessary. And we've had some marvelous surprises in this sense, such as when actors fall in love with speeches that we were sure would be cut, or less positive revelations, such as that a director's cutting of you know, repetitive language can make a bombastic and indeed repetitive patriarch 
far more sympathetic on the stage than we initially found him on the page. We aim for language that is as, as accessible as possible while avoiding anachronism. A great advantage of translation in this sense, of course, is that it makes the historical text proximate. We don't translate back into Shakespeareese. The canon we are promoting, fresh and accessible, thus provides an interesting alternative to contemporary initiatives to, quote, translate Shakespeare into modern American. Instead of another path to Shakespeare, we propose a broader range of American classics that as translated texts paradoxically speak a more proximate tongue. We decided against translating the Commedia into verse because while there are certainly some very successful examples, it seemed to us that it would be more difficult for actors in LA and across the US to work with verse than with prose. It's also the case that the Commedia's highly flexible versification with different forms for different registers has no real equivalent in English. At UCLA, we partner with the theater department to have students in the graduate acting and directing programs hold stage readings of our translations as we complete them under the direction of Professor Michael Hackett. This is an essential part of our translation process as it allows us to refine the translations based on actors and directors experience of them. We attend rehearsals and serve as dramaturgs while also taking copious notes on how jokes land, whether a particular line is difficult for actors to say and more. So we've translated eight plays collaboratively to date with additional plays translated by members of the group. We publish them in a series from Juan de la Cuesta and make them available open access for anyone to download from our website. We also develop supporting materials to support theater makers and educators who wish to engage with this. We've also produced a bilingual anthology of monologues from the Comedia for actors so that theater practitioners might encounter the Comedia earlier and more often in their training and auditions on the theory that they must familiarize themselves with Hispanic classical canon as part of their training, if they are to return to it throughout their careers, whether as actors or directors. So our dual language anthology of monologues from the Comedia, 90 monologues from classical Spanish theater is designed to entice practitioners in training and to whet the curiosity of the broader acting community. Broadly speaking, we are committed to reaching out to practitioners and offering them our assistance as they weigh the possibility of producing a play from the Hispanic classical canon. We've now developed partnerships with a number of companies in Los Angeles, across the US and beyond to encourage them to explore this corpus. These include everything from regional theaters like A Noise Within in Los Angeles and The Guthrie in Minnesota to specialized companies like Red Bull in New York, the Globe in London, and the Stratford Festival in Canada. We've also gradually moved into producing in our own right. For decades, the main festival of Hispanic classical theater in the US took place on the US-Mexico border at Chamizal, Texas, as part of an initiative to ease tensions at the border. The festival, which has a fascinating history of its own, is actually run by the National Park Service as part of, part of a federal monument. It's a fascinating history um, that Esther Fernandez has uh, published on. Uh, Los Angeles, a city of over 4 million Spanish speakers, has had nothing of the sort. Although we've had our share of Latinized Shakespeare's, to be sure, in productions for school children uh, with titles such as Romeo and Juliet, a Zoot Suit musical, or Much Ado About Nothing, mariachi style. As is the case across the US, cultural capital is so profoundly bound up in Shakespeare that other rich possibilities for giving audiences and especially Latinx audiences an appreciation for the arts are neglected. Diversifying the classics is trying to address the situation with our biennial festival of Hispanic classical theater, La Escena, which was founded in 2018. Our festival brings together US, Latin American, and Spanish companies in a combination of productions and stage readings that showcase the many faces of Comedia in the original Spanish, in English translation, and in adaptations. We are particularly interested in showcasing new approaches to the corpus and in formal inventiveness. After a successful first iteration in September 2018, our 2020 festival was nearly derailed by COVID. The pandemic, with all its unimaginable hardships for artists and performers, paradoxically led us to online forums that ensured greater access for audiences and much greater visibility for the festival. And just a parenthesis here to say that my, my book about theater of lockdown 
um, stem directly from my experiences in trying to connect with performers, many of them Spanish, um, who had moved into the online space and were producing really phenomenally inventive works. Um, so the, it, the November 2020 Lecena Festival featured live and streamed performances online, plus a distance curated walk through the city of Los Angeles, as our audiences went from what had been hundreds of spectators in person to thousands online. We are gearing up now for the third Lycena to take place at UCLA in September, 2022, mostly in person, but with an online component in a streamed reading from Red Bull Theater in New York. A key component of Lycena is our Golden Tongues Adaptation Initiative, which has now produced over um, a dozen um, new plays based on Comedia. Even before conceptualizing the festival, we had identified the goal of using adaptation as a way of familiarizing artists and audiences with Hispanic classics. In 2013, we partnered with the company Playwrights Arena, directed by John Rivera, which focuses on, quote, discovering, nurturing, and producing bold new works for the stage, written exclusively by Los Angeles playwrights. We agreed to commission adaptations of Hispanic Golden Age plays from LA playwrights, and then present them in staged readings. The partnership has evolved over the years to include more robust dramaturgy, as members of Diversifying the Classics team work closely with the playwright to select an appropriate source text and work out the many possibilities of adaptation. We provide a list of likely plays for the playwrights to consider in some bibliography. They then produce drafts that we workshop, and then we finally present the completed plays in staged readings now in the context of Lycena. I am perhaps most excited by the tangible lasting result of the collaboration, new plays that may go on to receive full productions or be workshopped elsewhere, and which make our initiative an incubator for new work, as well as a means to promote a diverse classical canon. So for example, Luis Alfaro's Painting in Red, which was first written for Golden Tongues, had a full production by Playwrights Arena, and the playwrights all continue to work on the various plays that they first developed for Golden Tongues. Whether or not these plays receive full productions, as is certainly our hope, we are at least familiarizing audiences and I think very importantly, playwrights with the corpus and its traditions. While Golden Tongues began as an effort to promote the Hispanic classical canon, the adaptations exceed any simple identitarian translation of the source plays into contemporary Los Angeles. The adaptations involve a broad range of ethnicities, classes, neighborhoods, and sexual orientations mirroring the diversity of the city. While Alfaro's painting in red dwells at some length on what Spain and Hispanicity mean in Los Angeles, most of the plays range freely among its many communities, often capturing the rich intersectionalities that make social relations in the city and its environs so complex. Whether it is setting Fuente Ovejuna amid maquiladoras or relocating the low lives of Cervantes entre meses to the hood, the adaptations powerfully imagine contemporary analogs for their originals. Annette Lee's Dog in the 626, for example, a version of Lopez El Perro del Hortelano, takes for its title the area code for the San Gabriel Valley, an area of greater Los Angeles that includes the largest Asian American community in the US and is particularly known for its large population of Chinese immigrants and Chinese Americans. So Lee's um, Diana, the Duchess of the original play, is here a haughty Chinese-American entrepreneur, while her servant Marcela becomes Diana's naive cousin, fresh off the boat. Mary Kamitaki's The King of Maricopa County relocates Lopez El Castillo Sin Venganza to a contemporary Arizona torn by politics and conflicts over gender, where the unimaginably transgressive union is no longer between Cassandra, stepmother to Federico, but between Cassandra and Freddy, the sheriff's closeted daughter. Given the range of imaginative recreations we've had so far, I really can't wait to see what the next crop brings. And we are going to be presenting three brand new adaptations as part of this year's Lycena. So as we continue to develop the broader project, we think constantly about what makes a classic Audiences are not created overnight, and it seems crucial to begin engaging students as broadly and early as possible if we are going to help them understand that there is a diverse classical canon out there. 
Hence, an additional initiative beyond adaptation and performance, uh, we, which we call Classics in the Classroom, and for which we launched partnerships with theater groups in LA that specialize in K through 12 arts education to develop curricula based on the translated plays and take them into classrooms with bits of Spanish as appropriate. The goal is to feature all of these resources our translations with introductions and notes, the lesson plans, the anthology of monologues um, on our open access website so that our work can be used around the country and indeed around the world as often as possible. More recent initiatives include our podcast series, Radio Comedia, under the direction of Marta Lala, and newest of all, a project to develop prose adaptations of Comedia for children in both Spanish and English. And I won't have time to discuss all of these today, but I would be happy to tell you more if you um, follow up with me or in the Q&A. Part of what has been so exciting about diversifying the classics is how it has broken down for all the scholars involved, the lines between arts outreach, performance, and research. As this project evolves, so does our critical sense of what adaptation means, the transformation of text through performance, and crucially, of the limitations of established canons, theatrical and otherwise, in a diverse US. For the graduate students, as for myself and my faculty colleagues, it presents different possibilities beyond traditional scholarship, whether through dramaturgy, translation, or adaptation, and encourages us to become involved as active participants in the arts communities that surround us. Thus, our scholarly work is strengthened via the connection to practitioners and audiences in the here and now, as we bring new classics into the American sphere. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Barbara. This has been so fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you for your introduction, how you introduce the visions of America, the concepts, the different concepts like Jose Martí and, and um, Felipe Fernández and Mesto. And thank you in particular for presenting this fascinating project to, to us all, not just the what it consists of, but the, the uh, how it transcends uh, uh, research and, 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 and your work to reach uh, to reach uh, society in, 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 in general and, and your, for your detailed explanation of it all. It's been fascinating. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> so Adri, uh, uh, let me invite uh, the audience to, to, to ask any questions that you might be willing to uh, share with our guest speaker. Anybody would like to ask? Otherwise, I'll, I'll start, okay? Um, I was actually going to, to ask you about your, your role as a translator, since you mm -hmm. also, apart from research and, and directing all these um, exciting and really innovative projects, you translate yourself. And uh, so I was going to ask you about Although you've already explained uh, explained it, uh, but, but but maybe you could uh, uh, explain your own your own appro approach to the text a little bit more. Like you you've talked about translation for perform, you've made it explicit that you translate for performance. Uh, do you ever translate for uh, for the page without considering uh, uh, the a stage performance or 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 um, do you distinguish between them, between the two approaches? Or for you, there yes. is a translating theatre without contemplating a stage performance? So, you know, I began um, translating um, in the sort of mid 2000s when I was doing a lot of work on um, moriscos in Spain and thinking about um, uh, literary and historical texts that really uh, reflected the complexity of um, their presence in the 16th century under increasing repression. And I, I have to acknowledge a colleague who works on um, England and the Mediterranean, Nabil Matar, with saying, you know, you need to translate these texts. And when I was um, just starting out in my career, right, there's the pressure of producing research, there's the complexities around how translation is and is not valued by institutions. Um, but increasingly with the years, you know, I just kept thinking, you know, he's right. There's a kind of what you owe the text and what you owe yourself in the work you're producing about them 
um, that suggests that a translation needs to accompany the critical studies because otherwise there's a huge audience that you're leaving out of it, right? So I first translated uh, two plays by Cervantes that um, had to do with um, Mediterranean uh, dynamics, um, La Gran Sultana and El Baño, Los Baños de Argel, which amazingly had never been translated into English. And when I did that translation, I really was, you know, thinking of it as providing a tool for scholars, right? So that all these people working on England and the Mediterranean who just said, oh, the Renegado is based on Cervantes could actually go look at the source and see, you know, what it involved. Um, and then as I finished Exotic Nation, um, it, it became really important for me to think about putting some of those texts out there, among other things, so that someone like a historian teaching undergrads in the US could teach the text, right? Those, those um, students wouldn't necessarily be expected to have Spanish or wouldn't necessarily have the level of Spanish that would allow them to read the text in the original. But if the texts were in translation, they could suddenly uh, encounter El Avencerraje or Osmeñi Daraja as part of a survey, a history class, a, a comparative class that wanted to present you know, world classics. Um, and so it seemed, again, increasingly urgent to make sure that there were translations of the text um, that reflected uh, my own scholarly commitments to them. Um, and the sort of um, third piece of that triad, in a way, is a text that I'm translating now uh, with Peyton Phillips, um, Pérez de Itas, Las Guerras Civiles de Granada, and that is a project much delayed <laughs> by various factors. Um, but again, that's not for performance, and there you're still grappling with some of the issues around um, proximity and accessibility of the language, right? Um, with Pérez de Ita in particular, who's not um, a learned writer, there are questions around what do we do with the awkwardness of his text? Do we repeat, you know, do we translate his repetitions, his infelicities, et cetera? What are, how are we best doing justice to the text if you have to balance that proximity to the source and the likelihood that a reader in the now is going to gravitate towards it, right? So there's super interesting questions around the translation there. So the translation workshop where we have sort of um, through practice constructed this method. And I have to say, so all of those translation projects were already dialogic, they were all in um, collaboration with one other person in the translation workshop, I think the insight that I brought to it is that translation really benefits from that kind of dialogic exchange, that there's something really valuable about trying alternatives. And on our best days, I would like to think that in the Diversifying the Classics translation workshop, that it's like a TV writing room. This is the Hollywood example, um, because people, you know, there's 12 people around the table, sometimes 15 people around the table, and We've divided the play up into sections and uh, subgroups translate those sections and workshop them and then bring them to the general workshop. And then we try out solutions, you know, and when something lands, when something is right, the room will say, yes, that's it. That, that's the right solution, you know, or that's how to resolve this crux or that's how this joke should work, et cetera. Um, and it's both extraordinarily gratifying and very humbling. Sometimes when someone visits us, especially now when people are used to visiting on Zoom, someone comes to watch the process, they, they, you know, they, they sort of are a little bit horrified because we all have to check our egos at the door. No one can be too attached to any one solution. And then there's a lot of editing and table reads. And ideally by the time that process is done, um, no one remembers what part was theirs, right? Or who provided what joke. Um, and the, I think that the, that the shared and, and again, dialogic and sort of embodied experience of translation there is particularly important for something that you want to work for actors, right? So sometimes we come up with a great line and someone says, you know, that's too hard to say, that's too many S's, right? Mm -hmm. And we had an actor in the room with us early on and she trained us well to really think about, you know, breath and consonants and things like that. So in addition to all the regular complexities of translation, there is also that. Mm. That was a very long answer, sorry. I, I have a lot to say about translation. So interesting, this collaborative translation project that you've got. You mentioned that you, uh, you, you perform, if I understood correctly, uh, uh, both the classics in original form or in translation or, 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 or and in adaptation. 
is that, do you have a criteria, a criteria for choosing one or the other? Or is it just, if there is a translation, you perform it. Otherwise, if there is no translation, you sometimes choose the original or how do you well, choose? No, which it's, much more, it's much more complicated than that because it really has to do with, you know, so we would like to work on um, a, a local sort of homegrown um, body of people engaging with Comedia. There isn't much of that in Los Angeles. There is a company that is that does community theater called Fundación Bilingüe de las Artes, but there isn't much beyond that. Um, and uh, Dakin Matthews, who's our valued colleague and whose translations we've also published in the series, um, is a very famous actor and director who um, uh, brought, tried to bring Comedia to his own uh, company in Los Angeles, Anteus Theater, which uh, was fairly focused on the classics, eventually spun off his own company to try to get them to produce Comedia regularly. It's very difficult to get this on the ground, uh, off the ground, sorry, the actors. Um, in English, you can work with actors who have the classical training in Shakespeare. Finding in Los Angeles a body of actors with the classical training in Spanish is very, very uphill, you know, even though I'm sure they would all like to be in movies. Um, so it's a combination of um, finding companies in Latin America or in Spain who are doing exciting things and figuring out if we can bring them. Um, again, during the pandemic, it was super exciting to see um, the initiatives that were launched in Spain by the Compañía Nacional de Teatro Clásico, which had its Clásicos en Casa initiative, and really gave um, artists the space for thinking about how to use the digital space. So in our festival in 2020, we presented um, a work by the Spanish company Grumelot. They did a, an online piece based on text by Sor Juana, um, and it was fascinating. It used Zoom, it used apps. It was formally super inventive, um, but it was born of that moment. So it's really a mix. I think the adaptation project is something that we control and through our um, partnership with Playwrights Arena, we're very fortunate in that those are easy to commission and stage. Um, the, the, the rest of what we manage to produce and stage is really about what kind of interest we can garner from companies and what companies we can bring. Mm -hmm. wow. Thank you. There's one, there's one question by Socorro Suarez, who's a professor of English at the University of Oviedo in Spain. Uh, she asks, are students or translators aware at some point that pondering on the language or theme of the classics diversify their perception of Americanness? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think, so in the uh, translation workshop, it's mostly graduate students. And I think those students are very much aware of these dynamics. I would say we have, you know, a person from history, a person from music, everyone else is either from the Spanish department or the English department, and a number of them uh, work on Shakespeare. So they are very aware of these questions. And um, they also are reminded of them every time that we do a presentation or a workshop, say, with a theater department uh, at a Cal State or a community college in Los Angeles, and the students will come up to us, you know, the college students will come up to us and say, why am I in college and I've never heard of this, right? And so they have a very strong sense of the import of addressing this, this kind of um, erasure um, in terms of their own um, education and those of their peers. So, you know, we, we're very, um, we're very, we feel that all of the avenues for um, sort of making this point for trying to access students in various uh, contexts are valuable. And mostly we're just limited by our own bandwidth. So for example, I would love to work more regularly with undergrads at UCLA, but that's something that we're always trying to get to. Um, the project that I'm really hoping to get off the ground in the next couple of years we had a sort of moment of insight when we realized if we produce simplified prose adaptations that would be the base for a children's book, we're also giving educators texts that they can take into a number of spaces because before we had been producing materials on how to do a theater workshop, but we were still expecting the educator to deal with the original text, which is a big ask. So now that we're producing these simplified versions, we are thinking, if we can have 
grad students train undergrads into how to go into a set of community spaces or K through 12 spaces and introduce the Comedia, that would really multiply our impact. And we're lucky, we, we, we count on very um, thoughtful and um, engaged colleagues, um, Margaret Boyle at Bowdoin, uh, who launched an incredible public humanities project called Multilingual Mainers, you know, has been giving us tips on how you do that. How do you figure out, you know, the graduate students training undergrads and then working with community organizations to have that kind of impact. Again, sorry, a very long answer. I'm very passionate about this, so you'll have to forgive me. No, no, you, you, you transmit your passion and it's it's really fascinating. I, 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 I'd like to ask you to, reflect a little bit more on the concept of multilingualism because I think it's so relevant and so so necessary to 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 push it and I I liked your 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 I think it was your statement that recognition of multilingualism is key to changing our conception of the U.S. Um, so how do you how do you deal with multilingualism in this theater project. Do you, do you, by the way, do you find instances of multilingualism uh, in the classics? Do you introduce multilingualism in your translations? Uh, so there is, um, so there are texts, you know, in mostly in, um, uh, in Castellano that have bits of other languages. So one of the students um, is actually, uh, wrote her dissertation on Guillén de Castro and we've translated a number of Guillén de Castro's plays. He is a Valencian playwright and the use of either, you know, bits of Valencian or other mixes of uh, Catalan and Occitan languages in his plays and the characters that's um, associated with is, is a super interesting uh, issue. In our translations, um, we, we've discussed this a lot. Um, there, there are complex issues around leaving some Spanish in the translation. On the one hand, um, that might be wonderful for certain audiences and, and set of theater makers who are familiar with the Spanish, and that includes more and more of the US. It might also uh, make it more difficult for other practitioners to you know, sort of take that leap, right? People are very worried about things like pronunciation. So we always include a pronunciation key. Um, one of the things that we've experimented with in the more recent translations is the idea of a slash. So where we just on the line in the translation give two alternatives so that a practitioner or a director could choose which one they wanted to use. Um, again, it's, it's delicate because you don't want to do things like put all your interjections into Spanish, you know, because Latin peoples are so emotional, right? So, so there's like a, there's a, there's a complicated set of questions around hmm. where you leave the Spanish and what Spanish you leave in. So in much the same way that we translate every line and then expect and invite directors to cut, we've also tried to make sure that directors know that we would love to see a production with more Spanish in it and that we would love to consult and help someone put back more Spanish, but we would like to present a, you know, a complete translation so that the practitioner who is more worried about, oh, I'm gonna massacre the pronunciation, you know, can, can feel um, that there are no obstacles in, in their way. Mm. Wow. So you've actually, uh, have you reflected in your research on multilingualism from a textual point of view and also this, this contextual point of view, uh, which the US represents, uh, uh, is a good example of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm uh, how, how to put this? So I was very intent on, with the um, presidential theme for the MLA to mm. do something uh, capacious and that also addressed um, sort of my political commitments in terms of, you know, the version of the US and the version of the academy that I would like to see. I am not a linguist. I am not a specialist in multilingualism. So my, my experience within that is much more reduced to the experience of translating between what are two fairly major languages um, and trying to be attentive to issues of language justice, of the plurality of languages, 
Um, so in the research that I did as part of putting together that uh, program year, which is very, you know, superficial. And again, I have not, you know, I am not an expert on multilingualism. I was just fascinated to see how many projects there are across the US and in very different kinds of spaces that promote multilingualism from, you know, the University of Washington in Seattle, where um, indigenous languages was something that was done by experts and researchers and in a sort of, you know, almost um, purely scholarly mode to now teaching indigenous languages as one of the alternatives that students can pursue to satisfy their foreign language requirement, right? Except that's not a foreign language, it's mm. the language that was there before the university was there, right? Or the impact of putting up signs across the campus that are bilingual and that include, you know, the indigenous language and English um, as um, markers for people to follow when they walk across the campus, right? Things that expand on, um, you know, just the, the simple land acknowledgement to actually give students in these spaces an experience of um, inhabiting a space that is multilingual and multicultural and acknowledging those histories, right? So, um, Really, really fascinating experiences um, across the country. Um, Arte Publica Press in Houston and all the work that they've done to recuperate various kinds of uh, writing um, by Latinx populations in the US across the decades. Um, people who map uh, all of the linguists who map all the languages in New York City and then show the city why it needs to have public signage in multiple languages, right? So, so there's, I would say that on the ground, there are super exciting projects. Um, in the theoretical realm, there's a lot of anxiety about um, the machine learning and what that means for translation and uh, cultural uh, diversity um, and the way in which um, those approaches to translation sort of flatten difference. Um, you know, although at the same time, I have to say, when you read about things like the excitement of Quechua speakers when Quechua gets added to uh, Google Translate, which was just in the New York Times yesterday, um, you know, these, these users are complex, right? There are definitely challenges and things to be wary of in the machine translation, but it is also opening up new vistas of communication and possibility. Mm, wow, yeah, thank you. Are there any questions? I think we have time for two more questions if Barbara is kind enough to give us some more, a little more time. Any questions? So I'll, I'll, I'll ask another question. Uh, you've quoted Esther Allen, translation Esther, Esther uh, translator Esther Allen saying, uh, about, uh, talking about the delay in translating Jose Mati which, and saying that that delay had impacted, had affected his impact in the US. Um, how would you relate this uh, this delay in and 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 the the effect the negative effect probably of his impact to the delay in translating certain classics and your own the, the value of your own project uh, or your own research? Mm. Yeah, so there's a I think a much uh, longer and more complex history of how the Anglo world deals with um, uh, Hispanic materials. And so one um, thread of my research has been on that uh, long durée competition. Um, so a book that I wrote about 10 years ago called um, The Poetics of Piracy looks at the imbrication of literary and imperial histories in terms of thinking about what it means for England to take from Spain, to engage Spain as a, as a literary source and an imperial model. And while that might feel very far away for us, it leads to certain um, constructions of Spain and of whether Spain is you know, as worthy a source for text that you would translate um, as say France or Italy or Germany. Um, and I think it's, um, 
a number of comparatist colleagues and I have been working very hard, I would say over the last 20 or 30 years to try to surface that history to say, you know, there's nothing obvious or automatic about the way in which the US has thought about Spain and the Hispanic world. And though these histories can be uncomfortable, it's really important to address them so that we can think about um, how do we get to certain notions of cultural capital, right? Those, these are not natural, they need to be historicized. Um, and we need to think about um, why is it that certain texts read as, of course you would translate them and others do not. You know, as I was saying earlier, I couldn't get over my surprise when I found that, you know, we're not talking about a minor author, but these two plays of Cervantes had not been translated ever when I turned to them in, you know, 2008 or whenever it was. Um, and there is a there is a tremendous unevenness, I think, to that. Um, and, you know, that's there's there's a lot of uh, room for improvement, I think, in parts of the country, which, again, is more and more of the US, where there are substantial uh, populations that are Spanish speaking, that situation is improving. I would say that people who work on Spanish in the US in the 20th century would still argue that it is um, profoundly racialized, profoundly marginalized, and that that is what we are trying to address now, right? It actually occurred to me when you were describing the, the process of, of the, uh, I mean, the texts that you translate in, in the projects, that you might actually be helping to visibilize women writers from in, 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 in here from the Hispanic world, who, from the classical world, Hispanic world, who might be not, maybe not completely, but, but un not nearly unknown in, in, in Spain or in Latin America. I mean, you're choosing them, you're into incorporating them in the project might, might actually. Uh, well, is it I mean, for, for, audiences in the, in the, for audiences in the US, right? When you explain to them that these women had um, more agency than women in England in the period that actresses were, you know, not just allowed, but the divas of their time. But uh, no, actually, Afra Bain is not the first commercial, <laughs> you know, female writer um, that there is Ana Caro before her, right? When all of these is put before audiences, I think it's incredibly, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and, you know, the insight that the plays include very powerful roles for women because the actresses were so important, right? And that that might be an interesting distinction from Shakespeare and a reason that companies now might wanna to turn to those texts. All of that is very powerful. Wow. So that's a, a last topic, a very nice last topic to finish. Oh, this, oh, sorry, this is one, one question. So let, let, let me just ask it by Michelle Tanisa, who will be presenting in a, in a little while. So she's asking, I'm curious about the updating process. You had mentioned that one of the classics was set in modern day Arizona. Arizona, How does one make the classics relevant for contemporary audiences in modern day Arizona? Do you take into consideration current affairs or world events while transferring the source text to a new context? Yeah, so, you know, we're very fortunate. Thanks for this question. We're very fortunate here that we are really working um, in collaboration with these writers. So they come up with the setting and the rationale. And they, um, it's very interesting to see how often um, they are drawn to politics, right? So they're trying to sort out the puzzle, especially because so many of the writers are drawn to tragedy. How do you, how do you recreate in the modern world um, a context where, for example, sexual transgression matters enough, right? In a very, in a, in a very different and much more permissive world. And so several of them have gravitated to politics at a, as a space where appearances you know, matter a great deal still. Um, and so in this play, which is really very powerfully done, um, Mary Kamitaki wanted to, 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 she was imagining a sort of um, slightly disguised version of uh, Joe Arpaio, right? The infamous sheriff of Maricopa County and giving him, you know, this kind of family dynamic where he's going to marry a, a, a wife who is a person of color, although it's not entirely clear if he recognizes that. And she falls for his daughter 
who has never come out because she exists in this very conservative milieu. Um, and then the love affair, you know, instead of being between the son and the stepmother is between the, the closeted daughter and the stepmother. And a great deal of the play has to do with this, um, uh, the, the sheriff's political ambitions and how he wants to be more than the king of Maricopa County and seek national office and so on. And so the um, concerns of the original play in terms of how to reconcile the private sphere with, again, in the, you know, the Duke of Ferrara's public authority, um, she translated quite beautifully to this sort of modern politician's concern with appearances. So, so there's, um, I have to say, we're, we're hoping at some point to do an anthology of these adaptations. And I'm so looking forward to having the time to tackle that project because they, some of the texts are, are really fascinating. You know, they're not all equally successful, but sometimes the, the way in which the playwrights get at, you know, something like the DNA of the source, you know, and it looks completely different and you would think it's so far away, but they've captured something about, you know, the crux of the conflict in a way that is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much, Barbara. This one has been wonderful. So, uh, oh, well, there's one, yeah, just a very quick question by Socorro Suarez again. She asked whether the, the, the work you translated by Ana Caro is Valor, Agravio y Mujer. I think it is, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. We called it The Courage to Right a Woman's Wrongs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Barbara. This has been re a really wonderful beginning, opening to our symposium. So I can't thank you enough. We'll let My you pleasure. take a rest now. now. So thank you. I will be in touch. I'll be in touch with you because I think we should collaborate more. You, you know, the, with the observatory, I think uh, there's a room for maneuver for collaboration here. That would be uh, wonderful. Yes. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. So we'll have a three minute break. OK. And uh, so we'll be back in a minute. Please uh, uh, connect, your, uh, connect again, uh, yourselves again in, in about three minutes. All right. Okay, see you in a minute. Bueno, muy bien, pues retomamos el, el, el simposio después de esta estupenda, magnífica conferencia plenaria. Y empezamos entonces la, la, la sesión de las, comunicaciones, de las comunicaciones. Tenemos ahora cuatro comunicaciones, así que procedemos ya con la primera que va a ser presentada por María Bobea y es eh, bueno, Macarena, Macarena García Bello. María, tienes la palabra. Muchas gracias, Marta. Paso entonces a presentar a Macarena García Bello, quien comienza su formación académica en la Universidad de Oviedo, donde después de licenciarse en Filología Inglesa, completa una doble titulación de Máster Erasmus Mundus en Estudios de las Mujeres y del Género por la Universidad de Oviedo y en la Universidad de Boloña. La beca de formación de profesorado universitario le vincula su actividad investigadora a la Universidad de Oviedo y en enero de 2014 obtiene el doctorado con mención internacional por su tesis en literatura estadounidense, la crisis postmoderna del sujeto y la representación de voces excéntricas en la ficción autobiográfica contemporánea, obteniendo el premio extraordinario de doctorado. Posteriormente, la profesora García Abello completa un segundo programa de doctorado en la University of Maryland, especializándose en la literatura escrita por la población latina en los Estados Unidos. Con esto desarrolla una línea de investigación que se centra en el contexto estadounidense para abarcar diferentes perspectivas, combinando el estudio de aspectos de género con cuestiones transnacionales y enfoques derivados de los estudios culturales. Parte de estas investigaciones se recogen en diversos artículos publicados en revistas indexadas, así como las monografías Producción, Contraproducción de las Identidades de Género, de la editorial Arcibel en 2011, y Nuevos Horizontes en la Literatura Latina de Estados Unidos, de la colección de estudios ingleses en 2018. Hoy nos va a presentar una ponencia titulada Fronteras en la Literatura Latin X del siglo XXI. Adelante. Cuando quiera. Eh, buena, buenas tardes, muchas gracias. En primer lugar, me gustaría agradecer al comité organizador 
Eh, bueno, pues esta presentación, Fronteras en la literatura latinex del siglo XXI, eh, pretende incidir en las numerosas posibilidades que ofrece la deconstrucción de la nación y del género dentro de la literatura latina estadounidense del siglo XXI. Paso ahora a compartir pantalla. Eh... Bueno, antes de centrarnos en la literatura más reciente, y concretamente en el corpus de, de obras seleccionadas para esta presentación, eh, me gustaría comenzar mencionando un concepto que ha sido central y que ha marcado la literatura latina de los Estados Unidos desde sus orígenes, que es la idea de frontera, la frontera como eje, eh, casi como una especie de, de mito fundacional. Eh, Borderlands, la frontera de Gloria Anzaldúa, es sin duda el trabajo más exhaustivo que propone la frontera no solo como, como espacio geopolítico, sino también como eh, modelo teórico que plantea experiencias psicológicas, espirituales y sexuales de la frontera, entendida eh, pues, eh, como metáfora. Eh, la idea de la frontera proporciona un, una categoría de análisis muy útil a la hora de aproximarse a ciertas escritoras de distintos orígenes y grupos sociales desde los años 80. Sin embargo, en los últimos años, eh, esta nueva categoría de la frontera ha ido perdiendo relevancia en las obras de distintas autoras contemporáneas y esto pues lo que permite es identificar un nuevo rumbo en, en la literatura. Hay dos elementos centrales que marcan a esta nueva generación. Por una parte está eh, lo transnacional y por otra cómo lo transnacional converge con una visión más eh, fluida del género y de, eh, de la sexualidad. Lo que vemos es que la, la frontera pierde protagonismo frente a circuitos transnacionales y lo que podríamos considerar pues, como eh, una nueva frontera, que es la construcción de identidades de género más, más fluidas. Eh, con el fin de caracterizar este nuevo rumbo identificado en los textos, eh, 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 lo que propongo es adoptar el término latinex, que comienza a generalizarse en el seno de la comunidad latina en los Estados Unidos, principalmente desde el 2015, eh, para reflejar una visión más inclusiva de las identidades capaz de trascender los binarismos de género. La aparición de esta nueva eh, categoría surge motivada por el deseo de encontrar un lenguaje capaz de reflejar realidades que tradicionalmente se pues, eh, han visto silenciadas por no ajustarse a los mandatos y designios dominantes del género. La X se muestra así como ruptura y puente, ruptura en tanto infringe las normas gramaticales del, del español y puente por su capacidad de incluir subjetividades, sexualiz, eh, sexualidades y deseos in, invisibilizados por el, por el binarismo de género. Mientras que en Latinex la referencia a las latinidades rebasa los marcos nacionales, incluyendo sobre esta idea de lo transnacional, la deconstrucción del género vinculada a la X apunta, apuntaría a un espectro más amplio y flexible en la concepción de las identidades de género y sexuales. La confluencia, por tanto, de ambos aspectos sintetiza esta, eh, estos, estos dos eh, rasgos que singularizan a las autoras estudiadas y a sus textos, llevándome, por tanto, a ampliar la categoría latinex eh, para, para definirlas. Más concretamente, veremos eh, cómo se manifiesta en el, segundo, en el, en el siguiente corpus de, de obras. Days of All, eh, de H. Oveja, Straight Elements of Random Tea Parties, de Felicia Luna Lemus, Rosas de Abolengo, de Sonia Rivera Valdés, eh, de Chacha Files, a Chapina Poética, de Maya Chinchilla, y A Cup of Water Under My Bed, a Memoir, de Daisy Hernández. El énfasis en lo transnacional en las obras me insta no solo a tratar de rebasar las fronteras entre los distintos grupos, eh, sino también señalar las conexiones hemisféricas que los unen a Latinoamérica y al Caribe. Eh, los textos, al igual que las autoras, se sitúan en la intersección de distintos espacios marcados por lo transnacional y de ahí... Eh, la necesidad de adoptar un acercamiento que también vaya más allá de las eh, referencias eh, nacionales. La literatura seleccionada reflexiona acerca de los vínculos y conexiones entre las comunidades, mostrando las prácticas transnacionales de las protagonistas, así como sus efectos sobre, sobre ellas. Eh, una cita eh, de Steven Birchbeck que puede eh, servirnos como punto de partida, 
eh, a la hora de entender el transnacionalismo, es la siguiente. Eh, transnationalism describes a condition in which despite great distances and notwithstanding the presence of international borders and all the laws, regulations and national narratives they represent, certain kinds of relationship have been globally intensified and now take place paradoxically in a planet spanning yet common, however virtual, arena of activity. El giro hacia lo transnacional de los estudios culturales corre parejo a eh, los discursos también de las, de las latinidades y de las distintas definiciones que se han dado de la latinidad. Me interesa particularmente la proporcionada por Juana María, eh, Juana María Rodríguez como, eh, y cito, dimensions or the directions in motion of history and culture and geography and language and self-name identities. En lugar de proponer coaliciones, por tanto, en torno a las distintas categorías fundacionales, como podría ser pues, la raza, la clase o la nacionalidad, lo transnacional sirve como base para la construcción de las latinidades con las cuales se identifican las narradoras, entendiendo esto, como digo, según eh, la definición proporcionada por eh, Juana María Rodríguez. Eh, un breve repaso al, al corpus de obras refleja cómo los circuitos e intercambios transnacionales entre las comunidades afectan a la construcción de subjetividades fem, eh, femeninas en las protagonistas. Eh, empiezo por The Chacha Files. Eh, que es una colección de poemas de Maya Chinchilla, que promueve un acercamiento distinto a las discusiones sobre la diáspora. En tanto, se centra en la experiencia de grupos que tradicionalmente se pues, han encontrado infrarrepresentados en los discursos de las latinidades. Eh, Maya Chinchilla reflexiona acerca de su herencia y su compromiso como hija de activistas guatemaltecos en la bahía de San Francisco a lo largo de las cuatro secciones que componen esta colección de poemas. Eh, los primeros poemas podrían describirse como viñetas de su infancia, que muestra la mirada de una niña, que observa el activismo de sus padres, también eh, las muñecas tras las cuales se esconde el esfuerzo de su madre por sacar a la familia adelante, el papel de las abuelas como continuadoras de la cultura y tradiciones guatemaltecas, o el legado que ha dejado sobre ella el, el, su, su propio nombre, el nombre de, de Maya. A partir de distintos episodios, se exponen una serie de preocupaciones vinculadas a la experiencia de lo que podría denominarse como la diáspora centroamericana eh, en los Estados Unidos. Eh, Chinchilla destaca una multiplicidad de subjetividades y de experiencias que son irreducibles a un denominador común. Eh, asimismo, la atención a las actividades imperialistas de Estados Unidos, así como las instituciones que han contribuido a las mismas, ponen de manifiesto la imposibilidad de separar lo que ocurre en los distintos puntos del, del planeta. De esto se desprende un activismo que trasciende fronteras y que prepara el eh, camino para el establecimiento de los lazos de solidaridad, de solidaridad transnacionales que se van a ir entretejiendo a lo largo de, de, de estos poemas. En Rosas de, Rosas de Abolengo, Lázara, la protagonista trata de negociar las discontinuidades que marcan su, su historia. Nacida en Argentina, de padres desaparecidos por la dictadura militar, criada hasta los seis años en Cuba con su abuela y finalmente forzada a desplazarse a, a Nueva York. El itinerario eh, desde Argentina a Cuba y de Cuba a Estados Unidos no es casual, sino que sigue una secuencia lógica, el golpe de estado militar apoyado por Estados Unidos, causa un primer éxodo a, a Cuba y en cuanto a las condiciones en la isla, pues que terminan por provocar el segundo desplazamiento, que no son únicamente consecuencia del régimen castrista, también del bloqueo impuesto, eh, de manera que vemos cómo los nexos transnacionales se manifiestan antes y también siguen manifestándose en Estados Unidos, donde las conexiones con Cuba y Argentina no se rompen, sino que se refuerzan a través de los vínculos personales ilustrados por la protagonista. Days, days, uh, days of All también enfatiza los desplazamientos, intercambios y conexiones entre Cuba y Estados Unidos, así como su impacto sobre, sobre las vidas individuales de, la, de las personas. Eh, la narradora... Eh, Alejandra eh, San José, llega al mundo la noche en que triunfa la Revolución Cubana, pero tan solo dos años más tarde huye con su familia a Estados Unidos para establecerse posteriormente en, en Chicago. Alejandra todavía no se ha reconciliado con su condición de exiliada cubana, 
cuando descubre una descendencia judía que trastoca aún más sus sentimientos de identidad y pertenencia. Eh, cabe destacar que en ninguno de los textos existe una tierra de origen, sino que lo que vemos son distintos desplazamientos de los cuales surgen una multiplicidad de espacios cuyas fronteras parecen difuminarse. Eh, la conjunción de todos estos puntos geográficos y políticos lleva implícito un rechazo de todo esencialismo gesto unificador. También las respectivas búsquedas emprendidas por las, eh, por las autoras y por las narradoras a través de la escritura, pues vemos que tampoco ofrecen una respuesta, sino que lo que predomina en última instancia es la indeterminación. En These Elements of Random Key Parties eh, eh, vemos que se adentra en lo transnacional a través de Leticia, la protagonista, que oscila entre la influencia de, de Nana, de su abuela eh, mexicana, encargada de inculcarle los valores tradicionales de la comunidad mexicana en Estados Unidos, y las vivencias y relaciones que ponen de manifiesto una amplia gama de, eh, de manera de entender y experimentar tanto el género como, como la sexualidad. Eh, la ciudad de Los Ángeles, en la que se desarrolla la acción, cobra especial protagonismo debido a la proliferación de contactos que vemos, contactos, intercambios y flujos transnacionales. En A Cup of Water Under My Bed, Daisy Hernández emplea el género autobiográfico con el fin de construir un espacio textual que reconozca no solo la herencia cubana de su padre y colombiana por parte de su madre, sino también los vínculos que la unen a otras latinidades a través de su trabajo como desde las primeras líneas eh, de la memoria, se pone de manifiesto la manera en que la narradora no puede ni debe separarse del contexto en el que escribe. Eh, y digo, I began writing this memoir in 2000. I wanted to, to testify, to say this happens. These quiet stories were taking place when the students in Washington were waging their private wars in Central America, when they began showing the border into the desert when they insisted, don't ask, don't tell, when they sent NAFTA and everyone began seeking the safety of corners, to believe that my story, our story, any story stood by itself was dangerous. Feminists taught me this, journalism uh, confirmed it. Tras esta declaración de intenciones, vemos como la autora procede a dar testimonio de sus propias vivencias, los obstáculos y problemas a los que se enfrenta y que confluyen en la construcción de un yo en el que lo queer se fusiona con la latinidad. Eh, lo que vemos es que a pesar de sus diferencias, las novelas anteriores comparten un interés por lo transnacional que corre parejo al cuestionamiento de los discursos dominantes de género. Las relaciones, circuitos e intercambios que se establecen entre las comunidades de origen y de acogida crean un espacio en los intersticios desde los cuales se interrogan y en último término de construyen los discursos de género dominantes, tanto, y esto es interesante, eh, tanto en el contexto de Estados Unidos como en el de Latinoamérica. Es posible, por tanto, observar cómo este espacio transnacional demuestra ser un terreno especialmente fértil a la hora de deconstruir las identidades de género normativas y viceversa. Las subjetividades de las protagonistas desestabilizan también los eh, discursos patriarcales sobre los que descansa la, la nación. Eh, esto enlaza así con el término latinex, en el cual convergen, como veíamos al principio, lo transnacional, implícito en la referencia a las latinidades, con la deconstrucción de la dicotomía de género que apunta a un espectro más amplio a la hora de entender el género, el sexo y la sexualidad. Frente a una clasificación basada en categorías fundacionales, como la raza, la clase y la nacionalidad, es posible reconocer cómo a partir de la X se va un paso más allá, al trascender no solo los referentes nacionales, sino también las identidades de género y sexo. En este sentido, los textos analizados tratan una respuesta a las preguntas empleadas por Juana María Rodríguez en Queer Latinidades. How would intersecting Latin American diaspora figure into the pre-existing US cultural and ethnic imaginary? What would a more pluralistic Latino cultural imaginary look like, sound like, feel like, and embody as a whole? Indeed, new terms would have to be invented to articulate and represent new Latino social constructs in the making, hence the term Latinidades gain momentum among scholars and others. 
eh, de todos estos elementos analizados se evidencia una nueva generación de escritoras que, si bien aún pues, no han recibido tanta atención como merecen, pues con trabajos como, como el presente, con... Eh, pues lo que busco mm, es eh, poner de manifiesto estos nuevos caminos que están abriendo en la literatura del siglo XXI que ya pues, eh, podemos definir como latinex. Muchísimas, Muchísimas gracias. Sí. Gracias. Sí, gracias por esta ponencia tan interesante y cedo entonces la palabra a mi compañero Joseph que va a presentar al siguiente ponente. Eh, hola, muchas gracias María, muchas gracias Macarena también por esa eh, ponencia tan interesante. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to switch to English because our next um, speaker is going to speak in English. Our next speaker is Julio María Fernández Mesa. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in Hispanic language and literature and a master's degree in literature from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, as well as a PhD in Hispanic literature from the College of Mexico. He has published articles, short stories, and essays in books and academic literary magazines. He's participated in several national and international conferences, and his main areas of interest are Hispanic, English, and comparative literature. I also have the privilege of having his PowerPoint handy, so I'm going to share that with everyone as well. And then Julio, you can go ahead whenever. Thanks, Joseph. Good afternoon, and thanks to this symposium for accepting my proposal. And also, I would like to thank all the wonderful team, the organizers, Martha, Victoria, and Joseph. Thank you very much. The paper I will read is titled Mexican Significance and Symbolism in the People of Paper by Salvador Plasencia. I will center my paper only in one work, but I think it is a brief talk of mine could be easily linked with all the other communications of the symposium. The People of Paper, first published in 2005 by Salvador Plasencia, is widely regarded as a metafictional novel. While this is essentially true, I think that its Mexican significance and symbolism are as important. In this paper, I propose to analyze some of those symbols and how they shape Plasencia's book. As the people of paper is a very complex work, I cannot examine it as much as I would like to, but a relatively brief inquiry would suffice. By Mexican significance and symbolism, I mean the use of cultural references, items, and allusions that originate from Mexico, such as Loteria, Lucha Libre, games, food, cinema, etc. Plasencia was born in Guadalajara, Mexico in 1975, 76, sorry. His family settled in the city of El Monte near Los Angeles when he was a child. The People of Paper is his first novel. It may seem rather obvious, but it is not worth its point that Plasencia wrote it mostly in English. Spanish is present as well, but its usage is modest. The book is mainly set in El Monte because the author grew up there. While the text depends on its autobiographical layer, it, also, it is also very self-conscious, continuous, continuously laying bare its fictionality. In the novel, the term paper functions literally as a piece of paper on which to write, scribble, or toss it away, and a metaphor of creation. The title alludes to both functions. Many characters do not have human skin. They have paper instead of flesh. Even the sky of El Monte is made out of paper. Consequently, the paper beings cut off the skin of others when they kiss them or touch them or are badly damaged if their paper skin gets wet. Several critics have pointed out its self-reflexivity, the rich use of metafiction, and its reliance on magical realism as some of the novel's prime features. I agree that it makes efficient use of all those devices. However, the Mexican significance, which the novel also depends upon, does not draw as much attention, perhaps because it is not as familiar or known to some American critics. It is reasonable to argue that Placencia's Mexican roots and American upbringing enabled him to write the novel. For instance, 
most of the setting takes place in California and most of the characters either come from the US or Mexico. In the first place, there are many references to Mexican culture of varying importance in the people of paper. Some of them include, but are not limited to, glue sniffers, gag members, elote, sellers, and yes, Placencia employs the term elote in Spanish, but also corn and even maize, wrestlers or luchadores, cockfights, self-taught curanderos, suitsayers. There are literal references to Catholic saints, virgins, and religious icons, explicit callbacks to Mexican cities like Oaxaca or Guadalajara, and long words in Spanish like brinca, mijo, limpia, oso, papel. Some, character, some characters are clearly inspired by Mexican culture. Santos, a wrestler named Juan Mesa, recalls El Santo. Other characters share a Hispanic background like Rita Hayworth, a woman of some importance in the novel. Um, just a minute. Uh, is my boss, is my voice clear? Is everybody hearing me? Yeah. Yes, because I saw in the chat that somebody yeah, said that it is not must clear. Be a problem with her, with her, yeah, it must be a problem with her own microphone. But we everybody is listening. Hear you okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Sorry for the interruption. I continue. Um, other characters, like other characters, share a Hispanic background, like Rita Hayworth, a woman of some importance in the novel. While not of Mexican origin, Placencia comments abundantly on her Spanish roots as she was born Margarita Carmen Cancino. As she was a relevant American actress, several mentions of her career and movies extend throughout the novel. But which type of story is told on the people of paper? We may believe that Federico de la Fe could be the main character as the novel first part opens with him. He is the father of little Merced, an 11 year old girl. Her mother is Merced. They all live near Las Tortugas, a Northern river in Mexico. All of a sudden, Merced leaves them both. The father thinks she leaves them because he uncontrollably pees on the bed. As De La Fe wants to give her daughter a relatively good life, they settle in El Monte, properly setting the plot in motion. However, to put it simply, Federico and his family are some of the novel's vast number of characters. Here in the presentation, you can see the first cover of the book, and it features Federico and her daughter, and also a couple of paper flowers. Regarding its, its structure, there are four parts in the book, the first being the prologue, and the rest is the novel's backbone, which is separated into three parts, each containing several chapters. Most of the time, each chapter consists of some stories. Almost all of them have a title with the character's name or characters whose story is being told. So if the reader wants to know about Federico de la Fe, then those sections named after him are necessary to grasp his overall arc. Placencia uses this device to help the reader understand how each story unfolds and how they are all connected. The character sections are organized in columns in some chapters, while others are not. We find later on that the plot seems to, to be the war that Federico de la Fe and El Monte Flores gang wage against Saturn. Saturn is the fictionalized version of Salvador Placencia, who plays a crucial role in the novel, but not even him, but not even he is the main character. The war is supposedly a war for volition, a war against omniscience. Saturn's functions as the author's persona. He can stare down on every other character and know about them, what they do, how they dress, and whose friends are. He spies on them without any shame or remorse. De La Fe and the others feel abashed by this and decide to face him so that he no longer controls them. The novel's first part deals with this conflict at large. It is no surprise why the text explicitly questions many aspects of storytelling and blurs the line between reality and fiction. However, from the second part, we learn that Saturn is somehow indifferent to being the author's persona, to the extent that Smiley, a member of El Monte Florence gang, literally tears the sky apart because it is made of paper and manages 
to enter Saturn's house. Smiley finds that Saturn does not seem bad. Instead, he looks outlandish and distracted. Saturn does not care that there is a war against him. He declares to Smiley that he willingly surrenders. Hence, I underscore that Saturn is not the protagonist. The protagonist seems to be fiction itself. We as readers wonder why Saturn behaves as he does if he is supposedly as powerful as the author, exerting complete control over the text he creates. In truth, we find much later that The People of Paper is a story about unrequited love and abandonment. It is a story about lost and shattered relationships. Love and loss and loss are some of the novel's motifs. Of course, Placencia is more than aware of this, as shown in the following passage. And I quote, Requited love? The curandero immediately asked. It is more complicated than that, but yes, I said. End of quote. This passage summarizes the plot by explicitly drawing attention to one of the novel's motifs while providing extra information. Froggy, another member of the gang, gives such an answer. Indeed, it is more complicated than that. Merced never truly reunites with Federico de la Fe, not with her daughter, nor do Saturn with Liz. She was once her girlfriend. Perhaps Liz was Placencia's girlfriend in real life, as one of the novel's dedication is to her. The author repeatedly comments on the book's dedication to the point that he wittingly jokes about it, like not directly, directly mentioning her name, but rather using phrases that allude to her. But Placencia's book is not pure heartbreak and sadness. Another important motive is its playfulness. playfulness. Speaking of playfulness, it is essential to highlight how overtly Placencia uses images, typography, and visual devices, as this stresses how entertaining the novel is. There is everything, crossing outs, managing letters, blank and black circles and squares, maps, charts, drawings, scribbling, sign language, binary code. Next one, please. There we go. The first chapter of the first part shows an interesting visual effect regarding Loteria, a Mexican game. Let us remember that Merced leaving her family sets the plot in motion. De La Fe and little Merced try to reach El Monte to settle there. Two of these chapter sections feature two cards of Loteria, which are respectively El Diablito and La Muerte. De La Fe plays the game. The Loteria caller draws El Diablito and De La Fe places a bean over the card and also over La Muerte. And he loses every single game. Both cards are foreboding, signaling the ominous feature he and his daughter will face in the US and later on waging war against Saturn. Placencia displays images of both cards to draw attention to the Mexican game in the case the reader does not know about it. That is why the Loteria caller expressly explains the rules of the game. The images function as a kind of visual presage because in the same chapter, we meet baby Nostradamus, an influential character who, as the name implies, can see the past and the future. This character is reminiscent of a famous episode of Tristan Shandy, an 18th century novel by Lawrence Stern. And here you can see the two usages of, or one usage of Loteria and the black square of Baby Nostradamus intertwined with the black page of Stern. Those who have read it may remember that at some point, the Parson Jorix dies and the narrator cannot tell how he dies as he is taken aback by his loss. Thus, Stern uses a black square that covers the whole page. Death cannot be told. Instead, it is shown. Placencia does more or less the same with Baby Nostradamus. Whenever, he, whenever we see a section named after him, we see black squares or columns for the most part. Both Hispanic and English references converge visually rather than textually, implying that the author knows well how to link cultures no matter their differences. I want to finish this paper by analyzing how well-rooted the novel is in Mexican culture and references in a crucial passage that involves Saturn. Next one, please. Thank you. Saturn's heartbreak is described touchingly in the novel's last chapter, as his longing for Liz clearly shows how much he misses her, and I quote, 
she, whose name is no longer cited in the dedication page, would pick up and instantly hang up the receiver. And when she would not pick up, Saturn talked into the answering machine. It is me, so me. Te extraño mucho. So that she would understand and she next door could not overhear. End of quote. Two minutes, sorry. Yeah, I'm about to, to finish. He speaks in Spanish to express his journey. On the surface, he uses Spanish as a coded language so that Liz would understand him and the woman next to her not. More importantly, Placencia makes his persona and speaks Spanish for a narrative and expressive reason. Saturn talks in the most sincere possible way. He reveals how much he needs leads. Regarding the second dedication and what I have said about Saturn and Liz, Placencia humanizes the character relationship by making it believable and relatable, as he emphasizes both the positive and negative aspects, hence the next quote, which is literally the second dedication. What is, what is significant is that Saturn expresses himself in his mother tongue in a crucial moment, highlighting Salvador Placencia's cultural identity. In conclusion, The People of Paper is a fascinating work. It is an ideal case study about cultural exchange, influence, and identity. Even though I barely scratched the surface regarding the Mexican symbolism, I hope Placencia becomes more known in both Mexico and the US, and that we keep studying his novel. He is a young artist and will probably show us his future work soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Yeah, we hope so. We hope he becomes more better known. <laughs> so. Paso entonces a presentar al siguiente ponente. Cambiamos de nuevo al español. Eh, Antonio Barbagallo es doctor en lenguas y literaturas modernas por Middlebury College. Ha hecho estudios especializados en la Universidad Complutense de Madrid, en la Universidad Pontificia Comillas y en el curso o fines del Instituto de Cultura Hispánica de Madrid. Fue discípulo de Carlos Boñoso, Concha Zardoya, Ramón de Zubiría y Vito Justiniani. Es autor de un libro sobre la poesía de Antonio Machado y de una cuarentena de artículos sobre temas cervantinos, poesía y lingüística. Es también autor del poemario De vida o muerte y de un poemario inédito. Sus poemas aparecen en antologías en España, la República Dominicana, Estados Unidos y México, y ha sido miembro de la Junta Directiva de Aldeu y del Comité Editorial de Cuadernos de Aldeu, también miembro de la Junta Directiva y miembro del Comité Editorial de la Asociación Hispánica de Humanidades. Actualmente enseña lengua y literatura españolas, lengua italiana y traducción en Stonehill College, y es el director de la sección española en el Departamento de Lenguas Modernas. Antonio Barbagallo ha participado en congresos y recitales de poesía de una docena de países. En 1998 organizó un encuentro internacional de poesía hispánica y en 2015 una maratón cervantina en Stonehill College. Va a presentar una ponencia titulada Concha Cardoya, poetisa, crítico y maestra en el exilio. Adelante, cuando quiera. Gracias, María. ¿Se me oye? Sí, muy bien. Eh, este es una, un breve resumen de lo que tenía ya escrito. Española por los cuatro costados, aunque nacida en Chile, Concha Cerdoya ha dejado honda huella en el universo literario como creadora y como crítico y ha entregado un enorme bagaje de conocimientos y de contagioso entusiasmo y amor a cuantos tuvieron la suerte de ser alumnos suyos. Con 18 años se traslada a España, pero lejos de sentirse eh, extranjera y exiliada, eh, se sintió eh, como renacer. Y esto debido a que llegaba a un país republicano y liberal, donde allí nació a la vida intelectual y sentimental. De raíces navarras y cántabras, después de haber um, vivido en Zaragoza y Barcelona, 
um, se trasladó a Madrid, donde la joven estudiante de Valparaíso comulga con el espíritu castellano. Castilla le llena el alma, le llena el alma. Su amor por España es uh, in, incondicional y total, pero ella siente una especial debilidad por Castilla y, y en particular por Madrid. Y esto se ve claramente en su obra literaria. Los estudios de filosofía y letras uh, se habían interrumpido por la guerra civil y entonces uh, y por la dura, dura y dolorosa posguerra. Y en el 47 uh, Concha reanuda sus estudios y um, se saca la licenciatura en filología moderna por la Universidad Complutense. Uh, mientras tanto, entre el 42 y el 46, bajo uh, el seudónimo Concha de Salamanca, publicó 13 volúmenes de uh, cuentos clasificados como Historias y Leyendas Españolas e Historias y Leyendas de Ultramar. Aquí, con sugestivos títulos como El Inca Garcilaso uh, y La Desolada Pat Patagonia, la autora demuestra que no ha olvidado su infancia y su primera juventud andinas. Pero no es solo en los cuentos donde muestra estar todavía ligada a su pasado de ultramar, sino también y principalmente en el libro, en el primer libro de poemas, Pájaros de Nuevo Mundo, eh, publicado en el 46 por Adonais. En esta colección de poemas, a las aves americanas, la poetisa ex, eh, explícitamente recuerda su pasado al poner debajo del título Cóndor la dedicatoria a la can, al Aconcagua de mi niñez. Las aves, pues, se convierten en símbolo de anhelada libertad durante la dura posguerra, una libertad a la que se llega y eh, levantando el vuelo, un vuelo que por añadidura lleva a la niñez libertadora. Y así, con este libro dedicado a los pájaros casi de forma simbólica, Concha Cerdoya emprende el vuelo en el mundo de la poesía, el mundo que más que otra forma de creación le llenará la vida. En el año 48... Um, el año de su licenciatura, Concha Zardoya se traslada a Estados Unidos, donde obtiene su doctorado por la Universidad de Illinois y donde eh, su, que, su quehacer poético, uh, ya iniciado en España, se intensifica. En tierras americanas empieza para la joven pero madura Concha un exilio voluntario que se traduce en onda sentida humana poesía. De las tres actividades emprendidas, la poética, la crítica y la docente, es lógicamente la primera la que nos revela la sensibilidad de una mujer que ha dejado atrás lo que había amado y sigue amando, España, sus ciudades, sus rincones, sus gentes. Dominio del llanto, accesit del premio Adonais de 1947, había sido testimonio de cuán trágica y dolorosa se había revelado la guerra española para nuestra poetisa. Y ahora, como modo de salvación de este llanto, Concha vuelve su atención y sus sentidos a los animales, a los árboles, a las cosas, creando la hermosura sencilla que se publica en 1953. En 1955 gana el premio Boscán por debajo de la luz, libro que se publica en el 59. Eh, es en esta obra, a mi parecer, que Concha Sardoya, con delicada sencillez y hermosura, intuye lo que es el mundo, el universo, con todos sus seres que justamente viven debajo de la luz. Demasiados son los poemas que merecen eh, por lo menos un breve comentario pero no puedo dejar de mencionar la ventana donde la poetisa se desdobla, o mejor dicho, donde ocurre una personificación de la ventana. La pobre ventana, como la poetisa, es testigo de lo que ocurre dentro y fuera, y como ella se duele y llora, 
o se alegra y sonríe. Esta pathetic fallacy culmina en la última estrofa. Y he mirado a la calle por tus ojos y con tu mismo amor reconocido la piedrecita azul, el niño rubio y el airoso caballo que galopa. Ahora ya no sé si soy yo misma o si soy tu mirada enternecida. El jardín es un hermoso poema donde al amanecer todavía todo duerme, donde el hombre y sus malas pasiones no han despertado. Qué descanso mirar que todo duerme, ni la pasión secreta ni los odios se asoman a este mundo de las rosas, dormidas en sus oros y granates. No existe el hombre así, el sueño solo. Detecto en estos versos lejana influencia albertiana, concretamente de algún poema de Sobre los Ángeles. El amor por el arte en todas sus formas uh, le inspira a Concha más de un libro de poemas. Desde Mirar al cielo es tu condena, del 57, gran homenaje a la figura creadora de Miguel Ángel, hasta poemas a Joan Miró, de 1984, pasando por los ríos caudales, de 1982, apología de los grandes poetas del 27. La soledad causada por el destierro y por la pérdida de seres queridos es el origen de la casa deshabitada, 1959, colección de poemas hondos y llenos de humanidad. El tema de la muerte eh, ocupa en particular todas las páginas de Elegías, 1961, y muchas de Corral de Vivos y Muertos. Este libro, publicado en Buenos Aires en el 65, está saturado de la España vivida y añorada por la poetisa, España triste y sola, España de la guerra y de la muerte, pero España noble, la que nos hace pensar en un amuno y machado. Hondo Sur, del 68, recoge en forma poética el drama de los negros de las tierras bajas del Mississippi y de las plantaciones sureñas. Y libros como Donde el tiempo resbala, 66, Las hiedras del tiempo, 72, y Manhattan y otras latitudes, 83, recogen poemas escritos en diversos lugares del mundo o dedica, dedicados a distintas ciudades como su Valparaíso o uh, la, la Florencia Artística. Con la llegada de la democracia y después de casi 30 años de ausencia uh, y de angustioso destierro y de añoranzas, Concha Cerdoya vuelve a España definitivamente en el 77. Y de todo esto, de todo lo que supone este, este regreso, nace la obra culminante que cierra el círculo del quehacer poético del exilio. Retorno a Majerit, 1983, recoge poemas que en primera persona o en un desdoblamiento en segunda persona, derraman todas las emociones e impresiones de un ser sensible que tanto ha añorado su querida ciudad. Termino estas observaciones sobre la actividad poética de Concha Zardoya añadiendo que aún en los más dolorosos poemas, lejos de encontrar sentimentalismos, Solo intuimos la tragedia humana y el dolor personal, ya que respiramos la, estoi la estoica entereza y serenidad de una mujer herida, pero fuerte y llena de perseverancia, amor, fe en los demás y sobre todo en sí misma. Antes de trasladarse a Estados Unidos en el 48, Zardoya había traducido la obra en prosa y verso de Walt Whitman, iniciando así unos estudios americanistas y comparados y los continuó con una tesis doctoral en Illinois titulada España en la poesía americana y con una historia de la literatura norteamericana, valioso monumento a una literatura poco conocida en España por aquellos días. 
Um, el libro que se publicó en Barcelona en el 67 y es, un gran, um, es en gran parte un análisis agudo y fino de obras o aspectos de obras de poetas americanos como Edgar Allan Poe, Ezra Pound, John Los Pasos y Robert Frost. Pero estos no son los únicos autores estudiados en este libro. Y entre otros figura un madrileño contemporáneo de Unamuno que escribe en inglés. Su nombre es Jorge Santayana, filósofo y profesor aquí en Harvard. A pesar de la importancia de las mencionadas obras, lo que sitúa a Concha Cerdoya en el podio de los grandes críticos es una amplia colección de estudios sobre literatura española. Publicó innumerables eh, artículos en las más prestigiosas revistas literarias del mundo sobre autores de distintas épocas, entre ellos Cervantes, Becker, Unamuno, Machado, Lorca y Miguel, y Miguel Hernández. Del joven poeta pastor publicó una importante biografía crítica titulada Miguel Hernández, Vida y Obra. Y la editorial Guadarrama le publicó Poesía Española Contemporánea en el 61. A este libro le siguió Poesía Española del 98 y del 27, publicado por Credos en 1968, pero una versión modificada, ampliada y definitiva de ambos libros apareció en el 74 bajo el título de Poesía Española del Siglo XX, también publicada por Gredos. Me quedan dos minutos, perdón. Con esto ya podemos pasar a, a, a su actividad docente y se podría, que se podría resumir con una palabra, excelencia. Pero no estoy seguro de que esta palabra llegue a decir todo, lo que, todo de esta mujer, de esta maestra de maestros. Creo que habría que inventar uh, un nuevo calificativo solo para, para ella. La profesora Zardoya empezó a dar clases de literatura española en la Universidad de Illinois y después pasó por las de Tulane, Yale, California, Barnard, Columbia, Indiana y Massachusetts, de donde se jubiló y donde yo la conocí. Era en las aulas de la Universidad de Massachusetts, Boston, en donde yo y tantos otros oíamos la entusiasmada y entusiasmante voz de mi maestra junto a los ruidos metálicos de los antiguos radiadores. Oíamos las pisadas de Rocinante y del Rucio, la voz iracunda de Don Quijote, los gritos de Sancho Manteado y las risas de las mozas de la venta. La señorita Zardoya explicaba y a la vez exigía nuestra participación, pero más que exigir, inspiraba en nosotros la confianza de poder participar. Daba vida a los personajes de las novelas que estudiábamos, como también daba emoción y sentido a los más herméticos poemas de Lorca, Alberti o Alexander. Veíamos también a don Antonio en el entierro de un amigo. Le oíamos preguntar patéticamente a su amigo Palacios por la primavera soriana y lo veíamos pasear debajo de los álamos del río o trepar por los grises peñascales. Vallenclán, Baroja y en especial Unamuno se metían por nuestras venas, en nuestra sangre. La vivacidad, la energía y el entusiasmo, la sabiduría y el amor que mi profesora derramaba eran para todos enfermedades contagiosas. Este era el gran don de Concha Zardoya, el saber contagiar el amor por la literatura, por la hermosura, por la cultura, por España y sobre todo por la verdad. Sabía al mismo tiempo dialogar con el alumno, respetar sus opiniones y enseñarle a querer aprender. Tengo ahora el gran honor y la fortuna de poderle dar las gracias a mi querida maestra públicamente. Gracias por haberme dado la oportunidad de ser uno de sus muchos afortunados alumnos. Gracias, gracias Concha Zardoya y gracias a todos ustedes por haberme escuchado. Muchas gracias a ti, Antonio. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias por traernos a esta mujer tan importante. ¿Eh? Bueno.
Pasamos entonces, luego haremos un coloquio final, ¿eh? como saben todos ustedes. Eh, Pasamos entonces al, al último ponente de hoy, Joseph. Sí, entonces paso a presentar nuestra última, um, but also still very much loved and appreciated. Um, her, her work is titled Theater as Archive, Documenting Puerto Rican History and Collective Resistance and the Work of Carlos Canales. Um, this will be given by Michelle Tennyson, who is a PhD candidate and instructor of Spanish at the University of, Con of Connecticut. She holds a master's degree in Latin American studies from the Autonomous University of Madrid, Spain, and a master's in Hispanic literatures from the University of Connecticut as well. Her doctoral dissertation examines the social, political, and cultural implications of adaptation within 21st century Spanish Caribbean theater. Her article, Rethinking the Revolution, Re Religion and Politics in Ruasid's Afro-Cuban Adaptation of Fuente Ovejuna, was published in the winter 2020 special issue of Symposium, a quarterly journal on modern, lang on modern literatures, on theater and as adaptation in Spain or Latin America. Other articles appear in Hispanic Journal and Contextos Estudios de Humanidades y Ciencias Sociales. Um, thank you so much for being here with you. You have the floor. You're here thank with you. us, sorry. Thank you. Uh, to my own thinking, adaptations are intriguing works of art that I suggest are of central importance for the study of Latin American theater, as they signify a dialogue with world theater, literature, authors, and events. In the theory of adaptation, Linda Hutchin claims that adaptations constitute, quote, aesthetic objects in their own right, end quote, and broadly defines adaptation as both product and process of creative reinterpretation and recreation of ideas, stories, figures, or other works of art. Similarly, Argentine theater critic Jorge Dubati argues for a revalorization of theatrical revision. In his own words, Dubati asserts that there is a, quote, necesidad de estudiar las reescrituras de la dramaturgia universal como corpus de la literatura y el teatro nacionales, end quote. Dubati theorizes that adaptations rewrite the source text so as to, quote, implementar sobre él una deliberada política de la diferencia, de la que se genera un nuevo texto destino, end quote. For Dubati, it is within that política de la diferencia, the politics of difference or intentional deviation from the source text in which we may discover, quote, el tesoro cultural, end quote. Drawing from the ideas of Hutchin and Dubati, this presentation discusses Puerto Rican writer Carlos Canales' contemporary adaptation of Sophocles' tragedy, Antigone, retitled Antigona Barrio. I find refreshing that in Canales' adaptation, the lone female dissident is not destined to succumb to a tragic fate. His revision teaches spectators the value of solidarity as a means to reshape their circumstances. As we know, the source text centers around Antigone's defiance of the state. She demands that the corpse of her brother, Polynices, slaughtered during civil war, receive burial rites. However, her uncle, Creon, the totalitarian ruler of Thebes, has strictly forbidden it, deeming his nephew a traitor for his role in the uprising. Antigone goes against her uncle's edict. She is sentenced to death and executed. The play ends with a repentant Creon who admits to handling things, quote, all wrong. In Latin America, dramatists have redeployed the Theban heroine in contexts of armed struggles, authoritarian style governments, civil wars, and unburied corpses. The fact that women are the most vocal advocates of the deceased is another prominent similarity. In his book, Antigona, Una Tragedia Latinoamericana, Romulo Pianacci notes that Latin American Antigones uniquely tend to embody, quote, un enfrentamiento resueltamente político y esperanzadamente triunfante, end quote. He assures that these regional versions are significant cultural artifacts, quote, pruebas de la historia social y cultural latinoamericana, end quote. Written in 1968, La Pasión Según Antigua Pérez by Puerto Rican writer Luis Rafael Sánchez is among the most prominent Latin American revisions. In Sánchez's play, set in an imaginary republic, the heroine transforms into a regional symbol of resistance against political authoritarianism and US intervention a cause for which she's willing to risk her own life. For Victoria Brune, although the positioning of the protagonist within Sanchez's play, quote, as both actor and narrator endows her with a voice normally denied women, like many other Latin American women, real and fictional, who have tried to liberate themselves from the fixed roles assigned to them by the hegemonic discourse, Antigona Perez finds herself performing a deadly script, end quote. Carlos Canales' Antigona Barrio is similarly placed within a transnational context, 
The play had a successful premiere in June of 2017 in Caracas, Venezuela, and was later performed in November of that year in Puebla, Mexico. This 21st century rewriting features a young revolutionary heroine who confronts her tyrannical uncle, El Comandante León, the local chief of police. The modern protagonist differs in great measure from the classic president, as well as Sanchez's version in that she is not a member of aristocracy. As the title suggests, she resides in a working class neighborhood. What is more, this version liberates Antigone from her formerly doomed destiny. She instead works to rewrite her own and that of her community. Although the play is not explicitly situated within the Puerto Rican landscape, the plot captures two occasions in which neighbors from Canales' childhood community, Buenaventura in the municipality of Carolina, banded together to combat social injustice. During the 1970s, residents joined forces with Crown Cork and Seal factory workers who initiated a strike for rights to form an independent labor union and against their employers' plans to eliminate benefits. Community participation was pivotal in forcing the manufacturers to halt their plans. The factory's workers' victory came on the heels of a series of smaller community efforts. In 1970, locals were informed of the Highway Administration Agency's decision to build a new boulevard, which would obstruct their access to a principal throughway, encumbering daily life. Buenaventura residents protested together for months against the measures and eventually triumphed. Decades later, Canales dramatized his community's resistance and solidarity. Antigua Barrio represents what can happen when a community comes together for a common cause, and its protagonist personifies collective struggle. The first half of the play centers around a dichotomous dispute between a young and optimistic Antigona and her skeptical mother, Mariana. Like the Buenaventura community, Antigona organizes a protest against the disruptive and costly boulevard. Antigona therefore decides to confront authority, doing so despite her mother's deep concern for her safety. Antigona not only contends with the highway administration agency, but she also likewise opposes her mother's glum outlook. In her youth, Antigona's mother, Mariana, similarly organized demonstrations against unjust government measures. Nevertheless, Mariana's life did not unfold as she had hoped, and this makes her fearful that her daughter will soon face a similar fate. A significant divergence from the Sophoclean tragedy and other adaptations is that Canales' Antigona does not resist authority alone. In mirroring the Buenaventura residents, her struggle has the allegiance of a united community. All residents, except for her mother, are committed to the cause. Antigona urges her mother, Mariana, to conjure up her former passion for social justice to combat present hardships. And I quote from the text, ¿Qué fue de esa mujer que desafiaba a la autoridad? Hoy es el día de retomar la lucha, pero no la lucha por la independencia, porque de esa lucha te retiraste, sino la lucha de una comunidad que se levanta para defender su derecho a vivir como quiere vivir y no se lo quieren permitir, end quote. As noted, although Canales' work is not contextualized within a specific socio-political context, the mention of La Lucha por la Independencia, to which Mariana became devoted during her youth, is a reference to the Puerto Rican independence movement, which began in the 19th century while the island was under Spanish control. Despite its official name, Estado Libre Asociado, Puerto, Puerto Rico is governed by the United States Congress as an overseas territory. Puerto Rico, quote, belongs to, but is not a part of the United States. The island is considered foreign in a domestic sense, end quote. Law experts Burke Marshall and Christina Duffy explain, quote, people born in the territories are, are US citizens. All are affected by federal legislation at the sole discretion of Congress. None has representation at the federal level, end quote. In other words, although Puerto Ricans residing on the island are indeed US citizens, island dwellers do not have the right to representation by full members in the House of Representatives in the US Senate, nor do they have the right to vote in US presidential elections. The name of Antigona's mother, Mariana, conjures the historical Mariana Brasetti, a prominent woman leader of the 1868 Grito de Lares uprising. While the island was still governed by Spain, Brasetti, among others, led a revolution declaring Puerto Rico a sovereign, re sovereign republic. Although the forces of Spanish peninsulares managed to quell the revolt, the revolutionary spirit of the Lares rebellion has been continuously memorialized within cultural and artistic imaginaries. This brief summary of the complex historical backdrop against which Canales' play is set explains Mariana's pessimism. The Mariana of Canales' play shares a similar fate with that of the historic Mariana Brasetti, since her attempt to liberate Puerto Rico from foreign intervention likewise ended tragically. 
She worries that the sorrow that she has endured as a result of defeat and the loss of her husband, shot and killed by police during an armed uprising, will soon be relived, given her daughter's involvement in what she perceives to be a lost cause. However, this young Antigona's confrontation with authorities is different than that of the tragic heroine, as well as that of her mother. Firstly, she leads peaceful demonstrations and discourages violence. Secondly, her lucha has the support of the collective. This modern day protagonist offers a new vision for her community and tries to convince her predecessor that her quote, experiencia previa no es una repetición del presente, end quote. The present moment is always unprecedented, despite the similarities it bears with previous contexts or time periods. Theatrical adaptations bear similarities to their source texts, but they aspire to resignification, differentiation, and originality, as per Hutchin, quote, repetition without replication. It appears what Mariana was dreading has become reality when she learns that Antigona was arrested by Comandante Leon, the chief of police. An infuriated Comandante Leon clashes with the intrepid Antigona as she disputes his orders to break up the demonstration. Mariana's neighbor recounts how the residents united to confront El Comandante. And I quote, todos juntos, unidos, como una muralla, como una fuerza indestructible, end quote. Casting her fears aside, Mariana rushes to regain her daughter from El Comandante, proclaiming, and I cite from the text, mi hija me llamó esta mañana, me despertó del sueño, rompí mi tumba, removí la lápida, me escapé del cementerio, escuché la voz de la lucha, estoy despierta como ayer, te exijo que liberes a mi hija inmediatamente, end quote. Mariana resurrects her former revolutionary spirit, transforming it into power to reshape the present. She's successful in convincing a comandante to release her daughter without further conflict or bloodshed. Upon leaving the police station, Antigona takes one last look at El Comandante León. She notes that what she saw was, quote, un hombre solitario que se consumía en el sufrimiento, end quote. In the classic text, once aware of his fault, Creon tries to rectify his wrongdoing, but he is too late. In Canales' version, the tragedy is altogether avoided. El Comandante sheds his hubris in time to make a more ethical choice. Antigua Barrio is not a tragedy, nor does it end in defeat, but with the celebration of the victorious community. In a personal interview, Canales lamented the absence of official documentation regarding the highway administration's decision to rescind plans for road construction in Buenaventura. As noted within the play by Vecina, Mariana's neighbor, events such as the neighborhood's victory, quote, son puro humo, solo quedarán los que estén en los libros de historia, end quote. Depicting these past events within theater is a means to document the islands and Buenaventura's experience. Canales' impulse to record the past surfaced shortly after moving stateside in 2008. Canales is among the nearly 6 million Puerto Ricans living stateside. That is nearly double the 3.2 million island dwellers. The number of Puerto Ricans on the island has fallen sharply since 2017 in the aftermath of hurricanes Maria and Irma. Canales' recent literary production attests to the writer's grappling with the harsh reality described in the previously mentioned writer Luis Rafael Sanchez's story, La Guagua Aérea. Quote, si no puedo vivir en Puerto Rico, porque allí no hay vida buena para mí, me lo traigo conmigo, poco a poco, end quote. Since residing stateside, Canales' work evinces a longing to continuously return to the Caribbean island for inspiration while seeking connections with Latin America and world theater. Following the devastation of hurricanes Irma and Maria, numerous organizations throughout the Puerto Rican diaspora in the U.S. sprang into action to help with relief efforts. The largest burden fell on relatives of the displaced evacuees. The findings of a study on post-hurricane Maria uh, displacement migration note that, quote, communal solidarity was a key dimension of the positive responses to the disaster in Puerto Rico and in the city of Holyoke, a sense of solidarity among Puerto Ricans is a resource for future responses to a crisis, end quote. The relief process carried out by FEMA was highly problematic as the agency was slow to provide adequate support to victims, leaving an already financially devastated island in a state of humanitarian crisis. Some artists and street performers worked to support locals, providing entertainment as relief. Stateside communities likewise provided support to the island amidst the 2019 political scandal involving then Governor Ricardo Rosselló. Hundreds of thousands of protesters peacefully took to the streets to demand the governor's resignation. Mass demonstrations were organized on the island as well as in New York, Miami, Chicago, Washington DC, and Seattle. 
Rosselló resigned soon thereafter. The parallels between these more recent events and the story of Buenaventura's past as depicted within Canales' adaptation attest to the power of collective efforts as a strategy for overcoming social inequalities. Antigona Barrio stages the Buenaventura community's story of struggle and triumph within that of the classic text and memorializes their lived experiences, a part of national history that can be recovered in order to create future action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you all of you. That was really interesting and a very, uh, a very varied uh, 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 session with presentations of different, um, different genres, different types of writers, different periods. So let's uh, invite uh, uh, the, uh, the attendees to, to ask questions or you yourselves can also ask one another if you if you have any questions for any of the other panelists. Alguna pregunta de, de, de alguno de los asistentes? Hay una pregunta, me parece. A ver, no. Yo quería preguntarle, yo, yo tengo una pregunta para cada uno mientras la, 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 los asistentes no se animan. Eh, por ejemplo, a, a, pa, pa, Empezando por el final, en esta ocasión, a Michelle, eh, me, me ha gustado mucho una cita que acabas de leer, que, que del autor que dice, si no puedo vivir en Puerto Rico porque no tiene nada para mí o algo así, o porque no se puede vivir allí, me lo traigo conmigo. Y me parece a mí que eso, uh, esa cita encapsulates very well the, the, what the process of migration, the painful process of migration and exile implies, leaving a place physically does not necessarily imply leaving it behind. He says, me lo traigo conmigo, más que si no puedo vivir en Puerto Rico, lo abandono. He doesn't say, me lo abandono. He says, me lo traigo conmigo. I don't know whether you could expand on that a little bit more, that idea of not completely leaving a place when you actually leave it physically. Right, especially um, thinking about uh, the adaptation that I just talked about, which interesting is that the author, um, he, he thought of, you know, writing that, he, he actually wrote that play while residing in the United States, and he was, he was inspired by his, his, um, his native uh, neighborhood. Um, so he brought that memory with him and he wrote the, the thinking about the other themes that we've talked about today, um, such as migration, but also transnationalism, you know, he, he brings that the story of his barrio with him to the United States, writing this, the piece here, but that play was also performed in other countries. Um, it, was, or it was performed a, a few times in Venezuela and Mexico. Um, and uh, I, I think he's working on having it uh, performed maybe in Spain as well. So I think it's interesting how, um, he, you know, through the classic text, he's actually um, sharing the story of his community, his, his uh, Buenaventura de Carolina with the world, you know? And uh, so it's not just something that he brings here to the United States, he, he, he's, you know, sharing it with other uh, parts of the world as well. And I think that's that it's interesting because all of the um, other panelists also talked about uh, something similar, right? Bringing the memory of their, their country of origin with them mm -hmm. to the United States um, more particularly, more specifically. But yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the question too. Sí, pues en, esa, en, en conexión con este tema, también que le quería preguntar a Antonio, eh, en, el conexión, en relación a este mismo tema del, del exilio, de, de, de la vivencia del exilio, eh, Concha Zardoya, eh, eh, mencionaste en un momento que evidentemente el exilio es una experiencia dolorosa, eh, pero también nos has mencionado una vida muy rica, eh, hasta qué punto todo lo que ella hizo aquí habría podido hacerlo en aquel entonces en España. Entonces yo no sé si describirías, quizás un frívolo, pero eh, eh, ¿podría, se podría describir su, su, experiencia, del ex, la, su experiencia como positiva eh, por todo lo rica, por todo lo que le aportó a ella y que ella aportó, como nos has 
descrito. Y, y, y quería preguntarte si ella escribió, escribió, escribió sobre el exilio, sobre el concepto del exilio, si reflexionó por escrito sobre ese concepto. Um, el exilio de Concha um, Sardoya fue uh, un exilio voluntario, por lo tanto no podemos, quizás no deberíamos llamarlo exilio, um, pero uh, en cierto modo lo fue porque ya eh, el franquismo pues le agobiaba. Ella perdió un hermano que luchó por la república y, y entonces le afectó mucho. Eh, su, su estancia en Estados Unidos fue, eh, claro, muy, muy, muy rica. Además, no era algo nuevo para ella. Eh, ya lo mencioné, que estando en España antes de venir a Estados Unidos, ella ya había emprendido estudios por su cuenta um, de literatura estadounidense. Había estudiado um, a tantos poetas y había escrito un, la historia de la literatura norteamericana. Um, eh, por lo tanto, ya ella venía con, uh, digamos, con cierta mentalidad abierta hacia el, uh, el, lo que es la cultura estadounidense. Pero se encontraba aquí... Eh, aislado en cierto sentido porque eh, por la manera de vivir, por la soledad, eh, no estaba casada. Eh, de hecho, yo creo que el, el haber ido por tantas partes de Estados Unidos y eh, enseñado en varias universidades fue por voluntad propia. O sea, ella quería ir de un lado para otro y quería conocer Estados Unidos y además yo creo que en cierto modo quizás se aburría en algunos lugares y quería variar. Cuando se abrió la Universidad de Massachusetts en Boston, acababa de, de inaugurarse, acababa de um, abrir sus puertas creo que un año antes de que viniera ella, de que ya se presentó la posibilidad eh, seguramente Harvard hubiese querido tenerla, pero no había puesto en Harvard, ¿no? Y a ella seguramente le interesaba venir a Boston por varios motivos. Uno de ellos es las bibliotecas, ¿no? La biblioteca de Harvard. Y, y entonces, a, a, al ver esta, esta posibilidad, uh, este puesto... Uh, en, en la Universidad de Massachusetts, que entonces no estaba donde está ahora, porque ella no conducía, era una persona, um, en cierto modo, ¿cómo te diría? A la antigua, podemos decir, no conducía y vivía en, uh, justo en el centro de Boston, en Tremont Street, con una vista al, a todo el parque, una vista maravillosa. Nos, un día, una noche nos invitó a, a, a varios estudiantes y hay un libro, uno de sus libros que no mencioné, que se llama, se titula Los engaños de Tremont. Y claro, el, el que no sepa lo que es Tremont es, es la calle donde vivía, Tremont Street, ¿no? Y entonces eh, la Universidad de Massachusetts entonces estaba justo en el centro de Boston. Uh, sus, sus edificios más principales estaban en Park Square y tenía varios edificios, ¿no? Uh, varios edificios. Entonces ella venía a, a la universidad andando, se, se iba a casa andando, vivía muy cerca y... Yo he leído cosas suyas, he leído, encontré por casualidad, no estuve buscando en la, en la Biblioteca Nacional en Madrid, encontré um, unas cartas suyas que mandaba a amigas que estaban en España y no recuerdo exactamente a quién, a algún, a algún, a algunos personajes importantes, algunas uh, poetas y eh, recuerdo que en una decía que había pasado Semana Santa 
pero como si no hubiese pasado. O sea, dice, aquí uno no se entera si es Semana Santa, si es Navidad, si, o sea, estaba en cierto modo aislada en este sentido. O sea, lo, eh, le faltaba eh, las fiestas, es, las festividades, las, las manifestaciones públicas que se hacen en España, ¿no? De, de, de estas festividades religiosas Ajá. y eh, todo esto le faltaba. Ajá. Bueno, muchas gracias, Antonio. Bueno, pues siguiendo hacia atrás, y de, recuerdo que están todos ustedes invitados a participar, ¿eh? eh, eh a sal, Salvador, a, a Julio, a Julio Mesa, eh, te quería preguntar, eh, definiste de People of Paper como a case study about cultural exchange. Y entonces, uh, which, which um, U.S. authors would you say he, uh, Salvador Plasencia could be connected with? Thank you, Marta. I think uh, he, Plasencia is a very intelligent author because he knows how to blend in both English and Spanish authors, literatures, references. Mm -hmm. In regards to the specific question, I think he, he may be linked to John Dos Passos, for instance. Mm -hmm. But in, in his case, I think he's deeply rooted in both layers or both uh, cultures. Uh, a very notable influence in him is Juan José Arreola. The book by Placencia is basically a rewriting of La Feria. It's, it's very similar. They use a lot of um, similar devices. They're intertwined in many profound and complex ways because both of them are from Guadalajara and the people of paper is a noble. We, um, it's a brief noble. Each of these chapters it's not very long. Some of them even reach one page, one paragraph. Uh, and they are in interconnected between the overall work. And such is La Feria. When it comes to American authors, um, I think Placencia may be pretty much influenced by Kerouac, for instance, and any American novelists that uh, talk about the road, uh, diasporas, exile, but I think a, a good answer could be those passes. Mm -hmm. But La Ciencia is a, is a very young author. He is less than 50 years old. And I think it's interesting to know what he, he is going to do in the future because this is only his first work. Mm -hmm. We have a little to study, but this, this only novel is pretty complex and in my opinion, important mm -hmm. to develop upon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making us familiar with this, with this uh, uh, very special writer with just one work so far. So we hope he has a long career. Mm -hmm. Macarena, eh, yo, en primer lugar, quiero agradecerte la presentación que has hecho sobre el término Latinx, porque lo ha, en mi opinión lo has presentado de una manera eh, muy completa e, e, e incorporando conceptos que, que, que me parece que, que eh, aportan mucho a, 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 la, a, la, a, a la utilización de este concepto que creo que es controvertido ¿eh? Eh, y sobre eso te quería preguntar. Eh, por ejemplo, tú has mencionado algo que no se dice mucho y que yo, como por mi pasado de docente de fonética, eh, si, eh, pensé, pensé desde el principio, desde la primera vez que lo oí, esta palabra no se puede pronunciar en español. No la, o sea, eh, no porque no existe ese grupo consonántico en NX. Y aunque esto pare pueda parecer una trivialidad, creo que no lo es. Creo que no es una cosa trivial. Eh, en cuanto se pronuncia latinx en español, ya no estamos pronunciando latinx, estamos metiendo ahí una e etcétera. Bueno, en todo caso, lo que te quería preguntar es, eh, en conexión con esto que estoy diciendo ahora, ¿cómo, eh, se, eh, 
cómo se toma el hecho de que este término en el mundo académico hispánico, ¿eh? cómo se toma el hecho de que, este mundo, de que este término en realidad es, si queremos verlo así, una imposición del inglés o un, ¿eh? está tomado del inglés, así, ha sido creado en el mundo académico anglófono, latino pero anglófono, o hispánico pero anglófono. ¿eh? Eh, y por eso el latinx, ¿eh? porque ese cluster sí que se puede pronunciar en inglés. ¿eh? Eh, eh, bueno, pues ¿cómo se negocia esto? ¿Se ha aceptado así uh, sin ningún problema? Eh, sé que hay personas que, a las que no les entusiasma este, este tema, este, este término, perdón. Eh, no sé si es un problema eso de que sea una proceda del mundo académico, proceda del mundo anglófono. Eh, en realidad es un término estadounidense o, o, eh, para definir el mundo latino, pero estadounidense. No sé si puedes analizar un poco eh, este, estas cuestiones que, no deja, que, que creo que hacen que el término sea controvertido. O si ya está superado todo esto, porque al fin y al cabo ya llevamos varios años con el término. Eh, sí, much muchas gracias Marta, porque además mencionas bueno, varias cosas que yo creo que es, dan un poco lo que es en, en la diana de, de lo que es el término. Bueno, antes de contestar me gustaría agradecerles a, a, a mis compañeros, a, a Julio, a Antonio y a, y a Michelle por sus presentaciones. La verdad que bueno, eh, han sido muy interesantes y además sobre el papel no se, ve, no se veía lo, lo bien... Que, que se han entre bueno que creo que, que se han entrelazado los temas en cuanto a, a la palabra al término latinex que como bien dices efectivamente es un término muy controvertido eh, y que no todo el mundo acepta incluso como suele pasar con los debates lingüísticos incluso suscita debates acalorados eh, y hay varias cosas que, que creo que son muy interesantes a, en relación con esto y lo que mencionabas, que realmente procede de, de, del, del inglés, pero eh, es, es, es un tema generacional en el sentido de que las autoras, estas autoras pues, que, que estudio yo y, y lo que es la literatura latina de Estados Unidos, eh, el, el, el idioma materno, la lengua materna ya no es el español, es el inglés. Entonces, eh, claro, aquí lo que encontramos es un choque entre, por una, entre dos conciencias, por así decirlo, lo que es eh, la tradición hispana, eh, las, las raíces hispanas que se, o latinas que se reivindican eh, con esta idea de las latinidades y por otra parte pues una generación que realmente pues eh, o han pasado toda su vida en Estados Unidos o han vivido toda su vida en Estados Unidos o directamente han nacido ahí y su lengua materna ya no es el español sino que es el inglés entonces lo que lo que por lo que esta X resulta tan interesante es porque rompe las, las, las reglas de las reglas fonéticas del español las reglas gramaticales eh, es mmm, deja de ser lo que es, eh, rompe un poco con lo que es la pureza, por así decirlo, del castellano. Eh, pero, de, pero desde otro punto de vista, estas autoras también su objetivo es romper eh, a través de la literatura con eh, otro tipo de, de esencias o de ideas puras. O de... Entonces, por eso creo que encaja también, eh, sin dudas, controvertido y, y quienes defienden pues, una visión más purista del lenguaje pues les puede parecer una aberración, pero, pero bueno, es también un, un juego de lenguaje uh -huh. y cómo el lenguaje se transforma en contacto como es en este caso, con varias culturas, eh, con varias lenguas, eh, aproximaciones distintas a, 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 a la visión que se tiene de, del mundo y, y del lenguaje. Y ha arraigado ya en el mundo académico español y, y, y latinoamericano, pues eso yo creo que de momento es más difícil, es verdad que llevamos unos años con este término, pero tampoco son tantos años, yo creo que hace falta que pase un poco más de tiempo para ver si es algo que realmente se va, que está para quedarse 
o si va a ser una moda más, eh, con el tema de eso, de, de cómo se define la población latina en Estados Unidos en un primer momento, pues eh, claro, el inglés no distingue género gramatical, pero el español sí, entonces en un primer momento se opta por el latino latina, eh, luego se pasa la arroba y ahora estamos en la fase del X, entonces yo creo que hace falta esperar un poco más para ver, para ver qué pasa. De momento sí que es verdad que se ha generalizado muchísimo, pero, pero hay que ver. Muy bien, pues muchas gracias. No sé si hay alguna, alguien quiere hacer alguna pregunta o entre vosotros que es... Sí, Julio. Sí. sí, muchas gracias y me uno a las felicitaciones de Macarena. Muchas gracias a todos y, y todas. Fueron presentaciones muy interesantes uh -huh. y que me, me llamaron mucho la atención. Quiero hacerle una pregunta a Antonio. Me uh -huh. gustó mucho la exposición de Sardoya, yo no la, no la conocía. Sí. Y, y creo que hay un vínculo muy interesante, y seguramente lo has explorado, lo has visto, entre ella y Luis Arnuda. Porque si ella se exilia voluntariamente en Estados Unidos y habla mucho de Estados Unidos, en, en su poesía hace historias de esa literatura, traduce. Algo similar a César Nuda en Inglaterra. Adopta los modelos del poema dramático, por ejemplo, del monólogo dramático. Y estudia a los autores ingleses, le interesa la lírica inglesa, incluso tiene un libro. Ahora el título no lo recuerdo, pero vamos, la influencia inglesa en César Nuda es muy, es muy visible. ¿Y qué nos podrías decir de los vínculos de Sardoya? Pues Cernuda? curioso que digas eso, Julio, porque... Mira, eh, yo no lo conozco, yo no he leído todo lo que ha escrito Sardoya, he leído eh, en cuanto a crítica literaria, pues eh, cosas sobre la poesía del 98, del 27, um, y he leído varios libros suyos, tengo casi, yo creo que tengo todos los libros de poesía eh, que ha publicado, pero re recuerdo que hay un artículo sobre eh, la poesía de Cernuda que escribió Concha de Cernuda. O sea, no solo eh, ella conoció a muchos, muchos poetas, incluso uh, poetas de la, de la generación del 27. Conoció a Cernuda, creo, personalmente, ¿eh? y a varios. Uh, conoció uh, a, este, a, a Pablo Neruda en Madrid y a Gabriela Mistral. Entonces ella estaba, estaba más o menos aislada en estas ciudades de Estados Unidos, pero al mismo tiempo, antes, antes, porque eh, si nació en el 14 y emigró en el uh, 48, entonces ya tenía, uh, no era una, una jovencita. Uh, ya tenía cuántos, 34 años, ¿no? Eh, y entonces ya había vivido bastante en España, además había vivido en distintas ciudades, uh, Barcelona, uh, Zaragoza, Madrid, también vivió en Valencia. Uh, durante la guerra, debido a la guerra, uh, como hicieron muchos, como hizo Antonio Machado, que se tuvo que ir a Valencia, ella también se fue a Valencia y allí hizo un curso para bibliotecaria. Yo sé que ella, su, una de sus ambiciones mientras estaba en España, antes de venir aquí, era ser directora de la Biblioteca Nacional. Y pues claro, luego pues no pudo y se vino a Estados Unidos, pero sí. Efectivamente, lo que dices tú, es este, es esta, este vínculo cernuda con el mundo anglo británico principalmente y, y ella con el, 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 su vínculo con la literatura estadounidense principalmente, creo que también tradujo a algún poeta, algún escritor um, británico, si no me equivoco. Um, 
Creo que sí, tradujo a Charles Morgan y creo que Charles Morgan um, es, es británico, que no, que no es americano, que no es estadounidense. Uh, estaba ya metida en el mundo anglo ya mucho antes de, de su llegada a Estados Unidos. Y había traducido a Walt Whitman en, es, en España y luego... Aquí continuó su tesis, su, su tesis doctoral en Illinois. Um, trata sobre lo que es España en la poesía estadounidense, en, la, en los poetas americanos. Mm. No sé si te he despistado o... No, no, estuvo muy bien, estuvo muy bien, me suscitaste el interés en conocerla. Creo que es una editora bastante llamativa. Además que quería mencionar una cosa que, que esto que digo, que he dicho yo uh, sobre Concha Zardoya como profesora, ¿no? No lo digo solo yo. Hay, eh, no sé si conocéis a un tal Andrew de Bicky. Andrew de Bicky es un gran crítico un especialista, bueno, ya era, murió ya hace unos años, hace como 15 años. ¿no? Andrew de Bicky, uh, en el campo de la poesía, de la crítica literaria, eh, es un gran personaje. Y um, tengo una cita aquí, eh, en un artículo que escribió él en inglés. Eh, este señor, además, era, uh, nació en Polonia. De niño, creo que era de familia judía, y de niño se fue a Cuba, vivió en Cuba unos ocho o nueve años y luego vino a Estados Unidos. Um, y escribe, escribía en inglés y en español. Y dice, she will always be for me the shining example of the way in which teaching, scholarship and creativity go hand in hand. Y otra, otra cita muy corta de Andrew de Bicky. Graduates from all these institutions. Después él menciona también en su artículo todos los, las univers todas las universidades donde enseñó a ella. Y dice, graduates from all these institutions recall her influence and the ways in which she developed their insights into Spanish letters. Mm -hmm. de que, eh, ella dejó una huella en muchos, muchos estudiantes, muchos. Mm -hmm. Una huella personal en el aula. Mm -hmm. Muchísimas gracias a Julio por la pregunta y a Antonio por esta respuesta. Pues, gracias, Julio. Fascinante. Creo que todos habéis tocado ejemplos de transnacionalidad, de resistencia, pero a la, a, al mismo tiempo de asimilación, ¿verdad? De intercambio, de intercambio cultural. Eh, así que están en el fondo, aunque habéis tocado autores y autoras muy diferentes y géneros distintos y épocas distintas, en el fondo, como creo que señalaba Macarena, fluye ¿eh? una conexión. Así que bueno, no sé si para acabar, eh, tenemos cinco minutos, si alguno de vosotros quiere añadir algo para acabar que no haya podido decir, si brevemente podríais hacerlo. Eh, ¿Alguien quiere intervenir, alguno de los cuatro? Bueno. Uh, Marta, solo, solo, solo un pequeño, ¿se me oye? Sí, sí. Solo un pequeño comentario, Macarena. Um, Nada en contra de... Yo, yo soy uno de aquellos que, que está uh, en el otro lado ¿no? de, esta, de este gran debate. Mira, tú, te veo muy joven y entonces no sabrás seguramente que hace 40 años este término latino, latina, latino, no existía como tal. En España existía y los españoles decían, bueno, si tenía, oye, siempre llegas tarde, ¿qué, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Somos latinos, ¿no? O 
mmm, oye, eres un gran conquistador de mujeres, ¿qué le vamos a hacer? Somos latinos, ¿no? O sea, la, el español era el latino. Hace unos 18, 20 años, en España, estaba viendo la televisión así por casualidad, una, había una especie de concurso de baile, y entonces la locutora pregunta al público, ¿Quién os gusta más? Había una colombiana que bailaba, ¿no? Y una española. ¿Quién os gusta más? ¿La latina o la española? Y yo digo, ¡qué barbaridad! ¡Qué barbaridad! ¿La latina o la española? Claro, para mí, el latino es el español, es el italiano, el portugués, ¿no? lo eh, tradicional, ¿no? Entonces, que, se, que, que esto se expanda por extensión, que, que vaya a Hispanoamérica, a Latinoamérica, curiosamente, no va a Brasil. Los brasileños aquí no se consideran latinos, se consideran brasile, 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 brasileiros. Y, y no sé por qué. Entonces, si usamos este término, eh, deberíamos incluir a los, a los uh, brasileños y también a los quebecuas de Canadá, ¿no? O sea, es, es un término que inventado aquí, uh -huh. copiado por todo el mundo, copiado. Ahora se usa este término en Roma, en Lazio que allí es donde, de donde viene la, la lengua, la palabra, ¿no? O sea, es una barbaridad. Lo que pasa es esto, que cuando tú has mencionado literatura latina, claro, yo sé lo que quieres decir y todos los jóvenes saben lo que tú quieres decir, pero al mismo tiempo, ¿qué hacemos con Horacio? ¿Qué hacemos, qué hacemos con Virgilio? ¿Quiénes son estos? Si, si yo menciono a Horacio, ¿no? un joven, y cuando digo joven me refiero a personas de 40 años para abajo, ¿no? piensan que es, yo qué sé, uh, algún primo de Ricky Martin o algún primo de, 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 de esta, ¿quiénes son estos? Antonio, voy a tener que cortarte. <risa> sí, sí. <risa> Eso, quiero que lo medites, Macarena. Bueno, en, todo quiero caso, que lo medites. en todo caso, la controversia no era latino, latina, era latinex. Latinex, sí. Esa sí, es otra sí, controversia. Pero, pero, el, término, pero, sí. el término latino o hispano es otro tema. Es otro tema, lo que habíamos hablado era latinex, pero bueno. Eh, Macarena, por alusiones, tienes la opción. Muy brevemente, porque vamos a cerrar. ¿Eh? Sí. Sí, 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 nada, muy brevemente, que hay una palabra que va después de la literatura latina que es eh, lo, lo, que, lo que es esencial en este caso, yo no hablé de literatura latina, hablé de literatura latina en Estados Unidos, y eso 21. lo cambia todo, el contexto es lo que lo cambia todo, un poco más de fe en la gente menor de 40 años que, que entiende que, que cuando se habla de literatura latina punto, eh, pues eh, normalmente pues, nos, nos referimos a otra cosa, pero en el contexto de Estados Unidos, de los, la, la población latina en Estados Unidos, que como has dicho, es verdad, que es un término relativamente, relativamente reciente, aunque no tanto, ¿eh? porque ya, eh, mientras que lo de Latinex, veremos a ver si, si permanece lo de las latinidades dentro de Estados Unidos, yo creo que se ha consolidado bastante, o eso parece, pero eso, lo que es clave es el, el contexto latino en Estados Unidos. Y nada, con eso ya... Y en el siglo XXI, bueno. además, señalabas. ¿eh? Bueno, pues no sé si alguien no sé si Michelle quiere añadir algo o, o no, o ya está. ¿eh? Muy bien. Bueno, pues muchísimas gracias de verdad a los cuatro. Ha sido interesantísimo, variado y enriquecedor. Eh, eh, creo que hemos iniciado el, el simposio de este año... Eh, eh, magníficamente con la, con la conferencia plenaria primero de Parapux, que fue espléndida, y con vu vuestros interesantísimas, vuestras interesantísimas comunicaciones, que además creo que han dialogado entre ellas muy bien. ¿eh? Así que gracias, gracias a los asistentes.
y les emplazo a, a mañana, a asistir mañana si pueden y, y, y les encaja bien. ¿eh? Muchas gracias, adiós. Mañana. Adiós. Hasta mañana, adiós.